Welcome back guys to another iceberg. Now I put out a poll about two or three months ago, depending on when this video comes out, uh, where I listed off various superhero iceberg topics, and I let you guys choose which I tackled first. And Iron Man won in the end, so here we are. Flash, Wonder Woman, Hulk, and even the X-Men will all be done eventually, you just gotta be patient. So anyways, before I begin the video, I need to mention two more things. The first is that this iceberg is going to tackle topics not just about Iron Man, but characters relating to Iron Man, like War Machine, Pepper Potts, uh, Ironheart, Mandarin, etc. Also, I did an MCU iceberg almost two years ago, and there's some topics about Iron Man that I covered in that iceberg. I also mentioned some topics related to Iron Man in both the Spider-Man icebergs and even the first Transformers iceberg, so if you're wondering why these topics aren't in the video, it's because I already talked about them in those videos. So go check out those videos if you want to hear me talk about them. They're pretty good. I'm not biased. With all that being said, let's get started. The Hulkbuster Armor As the name suggests, this armor was created by Tony Stark to battle Hulk in case he got a little bit too angry, and for fighting enemies who are as strong as the Hulk. First appearing in Iron Man issue 304, released in March 1994, in this story, Tony would put on the Hulkbuster armor to battle the Hulk when Hulk shows up to a power plant to investigate the Pentagon creating gamma bombs. And surprisingly, there's no winner in this fight. It ends with the two of them talking things out. Though this wouldn't be the last time Tony would face off against the Hulk, not by a long shot. Since then, Tony's built several different Hulkbuster armors, all of them having enhanced strength and resistance to physical attacks. Though some of these have unique abilities, like there's an armor that has missiles filled with adamantium nanoparticles, there's one that has the ability to inject anti-gamma radiation nanites, and there's one that turns into a car, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Probably the most iconic Hulkbuster armor was the one featured in the World War Hulk storyline. This armor, known as Model 36, was used by Tony to battle Hulk at probably his strongest. And he lost Hulk 1. The Hulkbuster has appeared in several different media, such as Avengers Assemble, Iron Man Armored Adventures, and Avengers Square Enix. Which, fun fact, if you summon the Hulkbuster and don't get in it, other Avengers like Black Widow can hop in it. A neat little detail in a overall mediocre game, I think. I don't know. I, I own the game, but I haven't touched it yet. The Hulkbuster armor has also showed up in the MCU, in Age of Ultron, Infinity War, and Endgame. Also in the Incredible Hulk video game, where there's like a million of them for some reason. Iron Man Armored Adventures Releasing from April 2009 to July 2012, Iron Man Armored Adventures was an animated series airing on Nicktoons. It was created to write off the success of the first Iron Man film, and is about a much younger Tony Stark, and by extension, a much younger Pepper Potts and Rhodey, saving the world from a variety of different villains, such as Iron Monger, Crimson Dynamo, Madame Mask, Living Laser, The Mandarin, Whiplash, Modoc, etc. But because he's so young, 16, he's got to balance his time between being Iron Man and being a normal teenager at high school. Yeah, it's kind of like a Spider-Man thing, but with Iron Man. While focused on Iron Man, he wasn't the only hero to show up in the series, as eventually, Rhodey would become War Machine and Pepper would become Rescue. Also, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Hulk, Professor X, Jean Grey, Black Panther, and Nick Fury would all make guest appearances throughout the show. Even non-Iron Man villains, like Magneto and Doctor Doom show up at some points. While this show isn't as popular as other superhero shows at the time, like Spectacular Spider-Man or Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, it still has a cult following to this day. Demon in a Bottle This is easily the most famous Iron Man storyline out there. Starting in Iron Man issue 120, released in December of 1978, and ending in Iron Man issue 128, released in August of 1979, this story saw Tony battle alcoholism. He had always been a drinker, but it wasn't until he accidentally killed a foreign ambassador due to a suit malfunction that he started to drink a lot. 
Well, besides that time, Tony had to literally quit being Iron Man because of his drinking problem, and Rhodey took over the mantle for about two years. Uh, anyways, though it wasn't actually a suit malfunction, it turns out that it was actually Justin Hammer and his scientists who had messed with Tony's suit to cause his armor to malfunction and kill the Ambassador. Even after discovering the truth and defeating Hammer, Tony continues to drink and drink and drink until eventually his girlfriend at the time, Bethany Cabe, gets through to him and gets him to admit that he has a problem and needs help. Tony stops drinking and the story ends. A lot of people believe that this story was created as a PSA of sorts about alcohol, but in actuality, that wasn't the case. Writer and artist Bob Layden said, quote, I'm going to quote David Michelini here, that it was never our intent to do anything relevant. We were paid to, basically, do the next episode of Iron Man. It's just that, in that particular issue, alcoholism was the bad guy, instead of Doctor Doom, or somebody like that. It was the bottle. That was our villain of the month. And that's really the way we treated it. We built everything up to that. But the point of it is, it was never... We never attempted to be relevant. It just, in the corporate world, what gets the guys? What causes the downfall? Usually it's greed or it's sex and drugs, right? Well, we couldn't do the sex part, right? Alcohol wasn't talked about all that much, really, to be honest with you. Especially with kids, you know, in that particular era. But, you know, we treated it as we intended to, as the bad guy. Because of its serious tone about real-world issues... This story, despite being the most famous Iron Man story, hasn't, and probably will never, be properly adapted in a show, movie, or video game. Though in Iron Man 2, the scene where Tony's drunk and he briefly fights Rhodey was actually confirmed by director Jon Favreau to be a very, very loose nod to the storyline. Igor Confusion Before the release of Iron Man 3, Fans were pretty hyped to see what looked to be the Hulkbuster armor in the trailer for the film. It looked a little bit different from your standard Hulkbuster armor, but it had to be a Hulkbuster. I mean, look at it. Well, as we know now, this wasn't a Hulkbuster armor, but instead the Igor armor, aka the Mark 38. Tony created it in-universe with the purpose of it being to lift heavy objects during rescue missions. While the Igor armor isn't a Hulkbuster, concept art for the Igor armor does have the classic yellow and red Hulkbuster colors. So there was a point in production where this suit was going to be a reference to the Hulkbuster. Deleted Scenes So I've already covered a lot of the MCU deleted scenes in the MCU iceberg, so if you want to see me mention more deleted scenes, go check out that video. Here are the scenes I covered in that video that relate to Iron Man. I'm not going to be talking about them here. So anyways, here are some deleted scenes from the MCU that relate to Iron Man or War Machine. In the first Iron Man film, a scene where Tony and Ho Yinsen play a board game was cut. They would be interrupted by a member of the Ten Rings, who wants to know when his laundry will be done. He actually bonds with the two for a little bit, but then Raza walks in and kills him for being kinda nice to them. A scene in which Rhodey smashes a car into Ironmonger was also cut. And finally, a scene where Tony bails on having a three-way in Dubai was cut. He'd fly off in his Mark II armor, and Pepper would find him later having a drink. In Iron Man 2, an alternate version of Howard Stark's message was filmed, where he'd be seen holding Tony as a kid. And most famously, the beginning of the movie was completely changed. As originally, Tony would be shown vomiting due to, you know, him dying throughout the film. Pepper then kisses his Iron Man helmet, throws the helmets off the plane they're in, and Tony jumps out the plane after the helmet. In The Avengers, during the Battle of New York, the other contacts Loki, and he tells Loki to use his scepter to control the Chitauri. Loki then realizes that he left the scepter in Stark Tower. This is the only deleted scene in the movie that I could find that somehow relates to Tony Stark. In Iron Man 3, a scene where Trevor talks on the phone about the Chinese theater bombing was cut. There was also a scene in which Rhodey orders a team of analysts to investigate the attack on Tony's mansion. A government agent would then tell him that the Iron Patriot's armor is almost ready, and that he's sorry for Tony's death. 
But Rhodey assures the agent that he believes that Tony is alive. In Age of Ultron, a scene in which War Machine contacts Tony and Black Widow about Ultron hacking into a nuclear weapons program was cut. It would then be revealed that after the party sequence, Rhodey would be deployed into the Middle East, which explains why he wasn't in most of the movie. In Captain America Civil War, it was going to be revealed that Pepper Potts was pregnant, as Tony was going to mention it to Steve. In Spider-Man Homecoming, a scene in which Happy Hogan is forced to end a call with his mom and then call up Tony due to the Vulture hijacking the Stark cargo plane was cut. In Avengers Infinity War, a scene in which Tony and Pepper discuss having a kid and their upcoming wedding was cut. Happy Hogan would then show up and chase off a paparazzi member. In Avengers Endgame, a scene in which Pepper tells Tony that their pet alpaca named Gerald ate all their berries was cut. There was also a scene that was cut that involved Howard Stark offering the time-traveling Tony a job. After Tony sacrifices his life, all of the Avengers, Guardians, etc. take a knee to respect him, which personally I think is a very silly scene. There would also be a scene in which Tony would meet his daughter, all grown up in the Soul World, after sacrificing his life. And finally, a scene in which Tony shaves a bit of fur off Rocket Raccoon was cut. Iron Man's armor fell in love with him. This is easily the most famous, weird Iron Man storyline. In Iron Man issue 26, released in February 2000, during a battle with Whiplash, his electric whips combined with the lightning from a thunderstorm somehow gave the Iron Man armor Tony was wearing sentience, so the armor came to life. Tony was, naturally, pretty spooked by this, but the two actually got along just fine. Until the armor confessed that it had fallen in love with Tony. It also then murdered Whiplash. All of this caused Tony to be understandably concerned, and so he brought the armor to Whiplash's funeral in order to teach the armor about morality. But instead of learning morality, the armor was just like, bring me back to base so I can recharge before I kill everyone at this funeral. Shortly after this, the armor kidnapped Tony and brought him to a deserted island and demanded that Tony become one with it. Tony refused to become one with the armor, and so it tortured him for a week on the island. The two would eventually fight, where it would be revealed that the armor had created a body for itself inside the suit, and then the suit revealed that its ultimate goal was to replace Tony. Because Tony wasn't wearing an Iron Man armor, the armor obviously won the fight, and just as it was about to kill Tony, Tony started having a heart attack. And so the armor asked Tony one more time to become one with it, so he could save Tony's life. But he refused. This somehow gave the armor a change of heart, as it tore out its own heart and placed it into Tony, saving him at the cost of its own life. Rescue? While first appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 45, released in June 1963, it took until Invincible Iron Man, issue 10, in February 2009 for Pepper to become a superhero. It turns out that Tony had created an armor for her in secret. She'd eventually use this armor to escape the police when Norman Osborn issued an arrest warrant for her and Tony. And after using this suit to escape, she would give herself the superhero name, Rescue, and would eventually start doing superhero missions, saving people whenever Tony was unavailable. Though she wasn't a permanent superhero, she would only do this superhero stuff on the side. Unlike other Iron Man and War Machine style suits, Pepper's rescue armor has no offensive weapons, so no guns or repulsor weaponry. Instead, she has non-lethal sonic attacks. But like with the Iron Man and War Machine armors, the rescue armor has evolved over the years, and as of right now, there's been five different variants. The Mark I, the Mark II, the Mark III, the Mark IV, and finally the Mark V. While Pepper Potts has appeared in various pieces of media, like seven different MCU films, her rescue armor has appeared in a lot less stuff. Notably, Avengers Endgame, Lego Marvel Super Heroes, Iron Man Armored Avengers, and Marvel Strike Force. There is also a nod to it in Iron Man 3, 
but it wasn't actually the rescue armor. Superior Iron Man. A lot of people call Tony Stark a bad person. And while, yeah, he's done some pretty questionable things throughout his existence, his most infamous act, or I guess series of acts, was when he became the Superior Iron Man. This all started after the event storyline, Avengers and X-Men Access, as in that storyline, a good chunk of Earth's heroes and villains got their moralities reversed. So the spell was undone at the end of the event, and everyone went back to their normal moralities. Except for Tony, as while evil, he had created a way to shield himself from the spell, and so continued to be evil. After becoming the superior Iron Man, Tony purchased Alcatraz Island, and built an extremely ugly tower on it. He then went on to poison the people of San Francisco with the extremist 3.0 virus via the city's water supply. And the virus would be activated by an app that he had downloaded on everybody's phones. This was a techno virus that turned people into their ideal versions of themselves, and so people became addicted to it. So addicted that Tony would eventually force players to pay $100 a day just to use it. Also, while Superior Iron Man, he changed up his armor to one made out of liquid metal that had a symbiotic relationship with him. Uh, no, it's not like a Venom symbiote, it's, it's different. He also created his own drone security force that watched over everyone's activity in order to prevent crimes. Eventually, Superior Iron Man would team up with the Earth's heroes in order to prevent an incursion from destroying their world. Though when their efforts failed, Iron Man and Captain America battled to the death as the universe around them ended. But then the universe was brought back and Tony was alive again. He was also a good guy again. They just didn't explain why he was a good guy now. The Superior Iron Man stuff was done, I guess. The Superior Iron Man armor has appeared in various video games as a cosmetic item, such as LEGO Marvel Super Heroes and Avengers Square Enix. The Thor Buster Armor While everybody knows about the Hulk Buster, less people know about Tony's other Buster Armors. I'll talk about the rest of them later, but for right now, I want to talk about the Thor Buster Armor. Also known as the Model 22, the Thor Buster Armor first appeared in Iron Man issue 64, released in January 2003, and as the name suggests, is an armor created to battle Thor. Why did Tony have to fight Thor? Well, in the country of Slakovia, a religion based around Thor was created. But shortly after this religion was formed, the Slakovian army then murdered a bunch of the Thor worshippers. This really ticked off Asgard, and so Thor and a bunch of Asgardians stormed into the country. Tony was then asked by the US government to go and talk down Thor before the United Nations steps in. Tony agreed, but Thor refused to listen. So Tony created the Thor Buster armor, which was powered by an Asgardian crystal given to Tony by Thor to create clean energy with. The two fought for a little bit, but Thor would eventually win. Luckily for Tony, Captain America stepped in and tried to talk Thor down. After smashing Cap's shield, Thor then realized that he was fighting his friends, not Slakovia. And so, he and the Asgardians left the country. And since then, the Thor Buster armor has never appeared outside of brief background cameos. Though it would appear in two different animated series. Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and Marvel's Avengers Assemble. Tony Stark Fakes His Death Have you ever faked your own death? I hope you said no. Anyways, Tony Stark's faked his death before. This happened in Iron Man issue 284, released in July 1992, which is also the first appearance of the War Machine armor. In this story, Tony was shot in the spine, which meant that he couldn't walk anymore, so he placed some tech in his back to fix his spine. But then the tech began to slowly kill him. In order to save his life, Tony then placed himself into cryogenic sleep. But instead of telling his friends and family that he'd be out of it for a few months in cryogenic sleep, he had everybody in the world, including his best friend Rhodey, believe that he was dead. Rhodey would then take up the mantle of Iron Man, 
and continue saving the world, as this was apparently Tony's final request. This was all despite Rhodey telling Tony beforehand that he never wanted to wear the Iron Man armor again. This would last until Iron Man issue 290, released in January 1993, when Tony came back and was like, lol, I'm not dead, and Rhodey was, understandably, a little bit angry. This would mess with their friendship for a little while, for, you know, obvious reasons. And so after the two worked together to fight off some robots, Rhodey wanted to get rid of the War Machine armor, but Tony convinced him to keep wearing it. And so Rhodey went off and joined the West Coast Avengers. And so yeah, that's the origin of War Machine. Tony Stark faked his death, did a little trolling, and uh, severed his friendship with Rhodey for a little while. Civil War so Civil War is probably one of the most famous comic storylines of all time. Everyone knows how it goes down. Bucky Barnes is framed for the murder of T'Chaka by Helmut Zemo. This makes him a wanted man, and uh, oh right, that's the, uh, that's the movie. Oops. Anyways, the Civil War storyline begins in Civil War issue 1, released in May 2006, and went on for seven issues. Only it didn't really actually last seven issues, as that was only the main storyline. This Civil War saga actually took place over the course of 102 issues, ranging from the main series to issues of the Fantastic Four, Punisher War Journal, The Amazing Spider-Man, Wolverine, Ghost Rider, She-Hulk, Iron Man, New Avengers, Cable and Deadpool, Miss Marvel, Heroes for Hire, Black Panther, etc., along with various new limited series like Fallen Sun, The Death of Captain America, Civil War, Young Avengers and Runaways, and Civil War, Frontline. Pretty much every single hero that was based in the United States took part in this conflict. So what started all this? The Superhuman Registration Act. This was an act put in place to force every single superhero in the United States to register with the government and reveal their identity to the public. This was proposed after the New Warriors goofed up and fought the villain Nitro near a school, and when Nitro did his thing and blew up, a lot of people died, including 60 children. And so two sides were formed, the pro-registration side and the anti-registration side. The pro side was led by Tony Stark, while the anti side was led by Steve Rogers, Captain America. The two sides consisted of various different heroes and even villains. The pro side had people like Wonder Man, Mr. Fantastic, Black Widow, Wasp, Sentry, Hellcat, Songbird, Blade, Stature, Green Goblin, Bullseye, Tigra, Doc Ock, Taskmaster, Lady Deathstrike, Bishop, Carol Danvers, She-Hulk, and of course, the clone of Thor, Ragnarok. While the anti-side had Luke Cage, Daredevil, Black Panther, Hercules, Storm, Cyclops, Human Torch, Spider-Man, Invisible Woman, Iron Fist, Punisher, Falcon, Jack Flag, Prowler, Photon, Wolverine, Goliath, Colossus, etc. And when anti-registration heroes were captured, they were put into a prison in another dimension designed by Reed Richards, a scroll pretending to be Hank Pym, and Tony Stark. At the end of the story, Captain America's side loses, and then Cap is assassinated by Sharon Carter, who was brainwashed at the time. Tony is then put in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D., a lot of heroes move out of the United States, and the events of Spider-Man One More Day happen. Basically, the Marvel Universe was never the same. The events of Civil War have been explored in various different alternate continuities, and served as the inspiration for the video game Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2, and the film Captain America Civil War. Iron Patriot There's been a bunch of Iron Patriots in the main Marvel timeline, though there's only been three main ones. The most famous one has to be Norman Osborn, 
In Dark Avengers issue 1, released in February 2009, Norman was put in charge of a new incarnation of the Avengers, called the Dark Avengers, and I talk a little bit more about them in the second Spider-Man Iceberg, so go check out that video if you want to hear me talk about the Dark Avengers some more. But basically, Norman had turned S.H.I.E.L.D. into a group called Hammer, and as the director of Hammer, he started recruiting people to be part of a team of Avengers sponsored by the U.S. government. This group, for the most part, was made up of former villains, and Norman took up the mantle of Iron Patriot. This was an obvious combination between Iron Man and Captain America. The Iron Patriot armor worn by Norman wasn't as powerful as the normal Iron Man armor, because while Norman was pretty smart, he didn't have the same technical skills as Tony. Also, because it was modeled off of an older Iron Man armor. And because of that, Tony was able to hack into the suit and take down Norman. The US government would then put an AI in the Iron Patriot armor, and it became the basis for a bunch of Iron Patriot drones that would be used by S.H.I.E.L.D. Then, in Secret Avengers issue 6, released in July 2013, Rhodey would become the second Iron Patriot, as he was sent in to confront a team of rogue Iron Patriot drones. The drones, recognizing him as War Machine, listened to Rhodey and allowed him to become their leader. This led to Rhodey putting on the armor, which was known as the Iron Patriot Mark II. This was done in the comics purely because in Iron Man 3, Rhodey's War Machine armor was renamed the Iron Patriot. But because this didn't stick in the MCU, I mean in Age of Ultron, Rhodey's next appearance, he was back to being War Machine again. This change in the comics didn't last very long either as by December 2014, he was back to being War Machine. This armor was pretty much just another variation of the War Machine armor anyways, as it had many of the same weapons. And then there's Sharon Carter, who very briefly became Iron Patriot in Captain America issue 23, released in September 2020. She briefly took up the mantle to battle the villain Selene. Since its introduction, the Iron Patriot has appeared in various different media, like Ultimate Spider-Man, LEGO Marvel's Avengers, Marvel Future Fight, Disney Infinity, and the MCU in both Iron Man 3 and Avengers Endgame. Now, you're probably wondering why I said at the very beginning of the century that there were three main Iron Patriots. Who's the third one? Well, I think she deserves her own entry in the iceberg, so I'll come back to her later. Iron Man 2099. So there's two different Iron Man 2099s and neither of them are canon to each other, or actually exist in the main 2099 continuity. The first comes from Iron Man Armored Adventures, in the Season 2 episode, Iron Man 2099, where Tony Stark's future grandson, Andros Stark, travels back to the present to prevent the AI, Vortex, from being created, as this AI would go on to destroy the entire world. So how did he plan on preventing Vortex's creation? Well, because Tony Stark ends up making it, he was going to kill Tony. As for Iron Man 2099's armor abilities, he has roughly the same amount of stuff as your standard Iron Man, with a few exceptions. For example, his armor can teleport and time travel. Also, his suit is run by an AI that's 10 times more advanced than Jarvis. Andros can also control his armor by using his mind. And after his one-off appearance in the show, he would never appear in anything ever again. Then, in Secret Wars 2099, issue 1, released in May 2015, the world was introduced to Sonny Frisco, the Iron Man of 2099. And like I said earlier, this is not the main 2099 universe. Although Spider-Man 2099 does say that this is his home reality, but that's just not true because this universe is listed as Earth-23-2091, while his is listed as Earth-928. Whatever, anyways, Sonny Frisco became this universe's Iron Man upon being approached by Alchemax CEO Tyler Stone to join this universe's Avengers, which consisted of Black Widow, Vision, Hawkeye, Captain America, and Hercules. As part of this Avengers, they'd come into conflict with this universe's Hulk 2099 and his team, the Defenders, which consists of Silver Surfer, Namor, Valkyrie, and Doctor Strange. 
The existence of the Defenders was kind of a problem, as in this universe, unless you're working for Alchemax, it was illegal to be a superhero. So the two teams fought for a little bit and Hulk was eventually captured. But this universe's Captain America felt bad for them, so she helped them escape, causing Sonny to fight her. Strangely, after the 2015 Secret Wars event, somehow Sonny ended up in the main Marvel Universe and was then brainwashed by the group The Fist. He was then freed from his brainwashing by Spider-Man 2099, his universe is Captain America, and the main Marvel Universe is Elektra. And after being freed, he was actually allowed to live in the main universe. And since his appearance in Spider-Man 2099 issue 25, released in July 2017, he has yet to reappear. Civil War 2 so Civil War II is probably one of the most hated Marvel storylines ever. It all centers around an inhuman named Ulysses Kane, who can receive visions of the future. Captain Marvel then comes up with the idea of working with Ulysses to prevent crime and disasters before they happen. But Tony was against this idea, since they didn't really know how Ulysses' powers worked, and the fact that it's even possible to prevent these future crimes and disasters proved that Ulysses' visions weren't set in stone. Also, there's the whole, you know, punishing people for they commit a crime thing. But Carol didn't listen, and two sides were formed. The pro-arresting people before they commit crime side, and the anti-arresting people before they commit crime side. Carol would then lead a team to stop Thanos, after Ulysses saw Thanos doing some bad stuff in a vision. But this little venture resulted in both War Machine dying and She-Hulk ending up in critical condition. After this, Tony was like, Alright, I guess I'm just gonna go kidnap Ulysses to study him. But then Ulysses was like, I got a vision that Hulk is gonna kill everyone. So some heroes then went out to confront Hulk, and in order to prevent Bruce from turning into the Hulk, Hawkeye killed him. But then it was revealed that Bruce had told Hawkeye to kill him if he was ever to Hulk out again. And then after a few more shenanigans, the two sides just went at it. As for who was on whose side, on Iron Man's side, there was both Steve Rogers' Captain America and Sam Wilson Captain America, along with Miles Morales, Deadpool, Doctor Strange, Kate Bishop, Miss Marvel, Black Panther, Mighty Thor, Luke Cage, Ironheart, Nightcrawler, Miss America, Mystique, etc. While Captain Marvel's side had Agent Venom, Star-Lord, Medusa, Kitty Pride, Gamora, Thing, Drax, Groot, Rocket Raccoon, Scott Lang, She-Hulk, Iceman, Spider-Man, Jean Grey, Karnak, Spectrum, etc. This conflict came to an end when Captain Marvel nearly killed Iron Man, and Tony was placed into a coma as a result. And then it turns out that this whole event was for nothing, as Ulysses then transcends humanity and joins eternity in a new plane of existence. Like with the original Civil War event, this event, at first glance, lasts nine main issues. But in actuality, it takes place over the course of 139 issues, spanning from comic series like Spider-Man, Mockingbird, Invincible Iron Man, Venom Space Knight, Nova, Captain Marvel, New Avengers, Miss Marvel, A-Force, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Totally Awesome Hulk, Guardians of the Galaxy, Thunderbolts, Deadpool, Power Man and Iron Fist, etc. And new limited series like Civil War II, X-Men, Civil War II, Kingpin, Civil War II, Choosing Sides, and Civil War II, Gods of War. As of right now, the only piece of media that's been inspired by Civil War II is the four-part third season finale of Avengers Assemble. Ironheart First appearing in Invincible Iron Man issue 7, released in March 2016, Riri Williams was a child prodigy and genius who went on to create her own Iron Man armor. This armor was made of reversed-engineered Iron Man parts and other pieces of tech she found lying around her school. And this suit didn't last very long, falling apart on her first outing as a superhero. But then Tony Stark found out about her and gave her the tools that she needed to build a better suit of armor. 
She'd work with Tony for a little bit, until he was eventually put into a coma after the events of Civil War II. But it turns out that Tony had created an AI version of himself to act as her Jarvis and help her complete the Ironheart armor. And since then, she's been a recurring character in the Marvel Universe. Though her first major outing did get some criticism, as she took over the Iron Man comic series for about a year and a half. She also received some very dumb criticism like, Why is there a black woman as Iron Man? This is SJW. This is, this is just woke. Just absolutely nothing arguments and criticisms. Uh, basically nothing but whining. I'm not saying she's an amazing character. I'm just saying if you hate her for being quote-unquote woke or SJW, you're dumb. Anyways, in regards to Ironheart's abilities, she has most the same abilities as Iron Man. She's got repulsor beams, the unibeam, some missiles, she can fly, etc, etc. She's also got the ability to flashbang people and take down people non-lethally with ultrasonic frequencies. Since her introduction in the comics, she's joined the Champions, become Lady Ironheart for a brief period of time, helped build the Wakandan Space Force, pretended to be Cobalt Man, and it took part in the Secret Empire event. She's also appeared in various pieces of media, such as Marvel Rising, Marvel Spider-Man, Lego Marvel Super Heroes 2, and the MCU. She's even getting her own miniseries later this year. Or next year, I'm, I'm not too sure when that's coming out. Doctor Doom as Iron Man In the aftermath of Civil War 2, Doctor Doom decided to take up the mantle of Iron Man. You see, prior to this, Doom had a change of heart and decided to befriend Tony Stark, becoming a good guy of sorts, even helping Tony take down Madame Mask after she was possessed by a demon. And so yes, Doctor Doom officially became the new Iron Man in his own miniseries called Infamous Iron Man, which began in October 2016 and lasted until its 12th issue in September 2017. Though even after this miniseries, he continued to be Iron Man until Fantastic Four Issue 1, released in August of 2018. As the infamous Iron Man, Doom wore a stolen Model 51 Iron Man armor, which allowed him to fly, gave him enhanced strength, it gave him a cloaking ability, and of course, repulsor blasts. And because it's Doctor Doom, you know, all of his Doom abilities are there, like, you know, magic and all that. Armor Wars Lasting from Iron Man issue 225, released in September of 1987, to Iron Man issue 232, released in March of 1988. The Armor Wars storyline is probably the second most well-known Iron Man storyline. This story saw Iron Man having to face off against his own creations, once his technology was stolen by villains and criminals. Basically, Tony went through a gauntlet of sorts, battling a ton of villains one after another. He even fights Captain America at one point in the story. Even the Chad Stiltman showed up, although he was defeated pretty early in the story. The first issue to be exact, but uh, still, he was there. Armor Wars came to an end when Tony decided to retire from being Iron Man, only to be brought back out of retirement in literally the same issue. Rhodey also pretends to be Electro at one point, which is uh, kind of funny. Anyways, two years later, in May of 1990, a sequel to the Armor Wars storyline began, called Armor Wars 2. And by sequel, I mean in name only. There is really no connection between the two stories. This story lasted from Iron Man issue 258 to Iron Man issue 266, released in January of 1991. In this story, Tony gets paralyzed and can only walk with the help of an Iron Man armor. But even then, he's practically useless in battle. And so Rhodey takes up the mantle of Iron Man to save the day, fighting against the Mandarin, Fing Fang Foom, and Kirsten DeWitt. Anyways, Armor Wars has been adapted in several pieces of media, from Iron Man the Animated Series, Armored Adventures, Kinda Iron Man 2, the video game Invincible Iron Man, and the upcoming series, or movie now, set in the MCU. Teen Tony. So in 1995, Marvel decided to make Tony Stark more hip and epic with the kids. You see, in the Marvel Universe at this time, it was revealed that Tony Stark was a sleeper agent for Kang. And I'll get to that a little bit later. 
And in order to stop this evil Iron Man, the Avengers look to their best hope in defeating their former friend. Tony Stark is a teenager from another universe. Well, I say teenager, but he's 19, so he's an adult, but everyone calls him Teen Tony, and 19 has teen in it, so I, I don't know. The point is, they brought in another Tony Stark, who helped battle his evil maid universe counterpart. In a battle against evil Tony, Teen Tony had some heart issues, and that somehow made evil Iron Man turn good for a little bit. And so he gave Teen Tony a chest plate that would save his life, at the cost of his own. So now, Teen Tony was the only Tony Stark in the main universe, and took over the Iron Man comic run. Though admittedly not for very long, as this only lasted a few issues before Teen Tony was killed. In 1996, the Onslaught event happened, which resulted in the Avengers and the Fantastic Four all dying. This included Teen Tony, but they were all reborn in a new universe called Counter-Earth. No, not that Counter-Earth. This was a pocket dimension created by Franklin Richards, and this was all part of an event called Heroes Reborn. Heroes Reborn lasted for around 40 issues, and when the event ended in 1997, all the heroes returned to the main Marvel Universe, and Tony Stark was now an adult. So what happened there? Well, it turns out that when evil Tony Stark died, he didn't actually die, but instead was transported further in the timeline with his memories and all of Teen Tony's memories merged into one entity. This was done by Franklin Richards, but it wasn't revealed until 2001. So in that like four years between 1997 and 2001, people were just kind of confused as to why he was an adult again. So basically, the Iron Man in the comics right now is a combination between the original Iron Man and Teenage Tony, with their memories just combined. This entire situation with Teen Tony, which was called the Crossing Event, actually caused longtime Iron Man writer Len Kaminsky to leave the series, stating, the Crossing was the reason I quit Iron Man. Editorial was utterly determined to ram it through, and once I saw no amount of reason would deter them, I had to walk away, rather than end up being remembered as the guy who made Iron Man suck. The Chinese Iron Man 3 Cut So when Iron Man 3 came out, if you saw the film in China, you would see an exclusive version of the film, with almost four minutes of additional scenes. So now you're probably wondering, why did Disney do this? Money! You see, at the time, China had a quota to restrict the amount of Hollywood films released in the country every year. So in order to guarantee that Iron Man 3 would be released there, Marvel filmed bonus scenes featuring high-profile Chinese actors to appease the Chinese government. Also, this cut of the film would begin with an ad for a Chinese milk brand. This was done because around that time, a major dairy company in China had to recall all of their baby formula due to mercury poisoning. This led to people in China being cautious about drinking milk products. So, did all these changes make the film profitable in China? Kinda, but not really. There's a reason why Marvel and Disney never did this again. Chinese audiences aren't stupid. They quickly figured out that the film's extra scenes were just to appease their government. Also, Chinese trailers for the film showed off most of the scenes with the famous Chinese actors, leading many to think that they would be main characters in the film. In reality, one was a minor character, and the other one didn't even play a character with a name. But despite all this, it still made a good amount of money in China. Because Marvel movies usually do make a lot of money in China. Iron Man 2020 so in January 2020, Marvel began an event called Iron Man 2020, in which Tony had convinced himself that he was actually an AI, and that his body had been grown to host a brain filled with a digital copy of his mind. Basically, Tony Stark thought he was a synth. Tony's brother, Arno Stark, used this recent development to take all of Tony's assets, which included Iron Man. And with all of Tony's tech and money, Arno decided to take down all AI and robots, as he believed a giant monster was coming to Earth and would assimilate all AI and organic life. Tony would then join an AI army to oppose his brother. 
He took the name Mark I, and Arno took the name of Iron Man, and the two battled a couple times, until eventually the giant monster arrived on Earth. And it wasn't real. It turns out there was no giant monster. Instead, that was a delusion caused by a disease that Arno Stark had. Tony then had Arno put into a new suit of armor he made, called the Virtual Armor, or the Model 68, which allowed Arno to live out his dream of taking out the monster he called the Extinction Entity, and Tony just left him there. As of right now, Arno is still living in that simulation. As for the Iron Man armor worn by Arno, that was the Model 67, and it was uh, pretty interesting. It's got all the standard Iron Man abilities, although various parts of the armor can actually retract to reveal secret repulse reports, so he's got a whole bunch of secret weapons. Now this story is pretty interesting and weird, but this wasn't the first time that Arno Stark wore an Iron Man armor that looked like that. In Machine Man Issue 2, released in July in 1984, the world was introduced to an alternate universe Arno Stark. He's from Earth 8410, and instead of being Tony Stark's brother, in this universe, Tony was his great uncle. Although it's also mentioned that Tony is just his uncle, not his great uncle, but then it's also been said that Tony's his first cousin. I don't know, the point is he's related to him. Anyways, he took over Stark Industries after Tony Stark died, and eventually became Iron Man. But instead of being your standard superhero, Arno became a mercenary for a little while, before eventually becoming a superhero. His armor is, for the most part, pretty similar to your standard Iron Man armor, but with some big changes, like having a tractor beam, a handgun, a controllable flying blade, and finger lasers. Side note, Tony Stark also didn't die in this universe, he just went into hiding or something like that, and wants to guide Arno. Arno Stark as Iron Man 2020 has surprisingly appeared in some pieces of media, like the Superhero Squad Online game, LEGO Marvel Super Heroes 2, and even Avengers Assemble. Tony Stark joins the Guardians of the Galaxy. In Guardians of the Galaxy issue 0.1, released in February of 2013, Iron Man joins the Guardians of the Galaxy after Star-Lord offers a spot on the team. Tony would chill with the Guardians for a little bit of time, doing missions with the team, and eventually even banging Gamora. While parts of the Guardians, he wore his Model 45 armor, also known as the Deep Space Armor. This armor allowed Tony to survive in space for lengthy periods of time, travel at Mach 10, and allowed Tony to activate and control other Iron Man suits light years away. However, he didn't stay with the team for very long. In fact, by Guardians of the Galaxy issue 11.now, released in January 2014, Tony was already off the team, lasting less than a year. He also stole some tech from Rocket. But at the same time, he also sent Agent Venom to the Guardians as their newest member. Though he didn't do this out of the kindness of his heart, it was because he felt the team needed somebody who spent most of their life on Earth on the team. It's pretty obvious that Tony's few adventures with the Guardians was just to get the comic sales up to get people more interested in both that comic and in the 2014 Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Iron Man on Disney XD. Good evening, Mr. Stark. What? How may I assist you? Suit me up? As you wish, sir. All right. Oh, come on! <sighs> Never mind. I'm good. Enter for a chance to win Iron Man's gadgets at drpepper.com. Blast off! Now back to Iron Man, right here on Disney XD. The Model 52. First appearing in all new, all different Avengers, issue 1, released in November of 2015, this is the Hulkbuster armor that turns into a flying car that I briefly mentioned at the very beginning of the video. For the most part, it's your standard Hulkbuster armor, besides the whole, you know, transforming into a flying car thing. But what also makes this armor unique 
is that it's one of the rare cases of the comics adapting something from the films. As you've probably figured out by now, this Hulkbuster design is based on the Hulkbuster featured in the film Age of Ultron, though sadly the one in the film doesn't turn into a car. Video game guest appearances. Despite there not really being a ton of Iron Man solo games out there, Iron Man has actually made guest appearances in a few video games where he's not the focus. I'm also not counting giant crossover games like Marvel Ultimate Alliance or Marvel vs. Capcom. He's an unlockable character in X-Men Legends 2, Rise of Apocalypse. He's unlocked by gathering four different homing beacons in each of the game's acts. By getting all these homing beacons, you can then access secret areas to collect his armor. And once you get all four pieces of armor, you unlock him. There's even an alternate skin for him that turns him into War Machine. Iron Man also makes a non-playable appearance in, of all things, the 2005 Punisher game, where the Yakuza group, the Eternal Sun, try to steal one of his Iron Man suits. And so the Punisher guns down a bunch of these dudes at Stark Towers. Also, breaking my rule a little bit here, but Iron Man also appears in Avengers in Galactic Storm, an arcade game from 1995, and for whatever reason, Iron Man wasn't included as a main fighter, but instead as an assist character. Iron Shogun. So I'm writing this entry on April 12th, 2023, and this comic doesn't come out until May 10th, 2023, so I can't go into detail about any of the comic's plot because it's not out yet. Maybe it'll be out when this video's done? I don't know. Anyways, in I Am Iron Man issue 3, released in May 2023, Tony Stark dons a new set of armor called the Iron Shogun Armor and wields two different plasma katanas. And in this story, he sets out on a mission in the 1990s to do something for his dead mom that he failed to save the life of. Not really much else for me to say here. If you're interested in the Iron Shogun, go check out the comic on May 10th. Sorcerer Supreme In What If, issue 113, released in August of 1998, a story was told in which Tony Stark became the Sorcerer Supreme. In this universe, travel to Tibet with Stephen Strange to meet with the Ancient One in order for him to fix Strange's hands. This was after Strange had his hands permanently damaged in a car crash while Tony was driving. While in Tibet, Tony figured out that Baron Mordo was doing some pretty bad stuff, and so he trained under the Ancient One in order to use magic to defeat Mordo. And once he did, the Ancient One declared that he was the Sorcerer Supreme. And as the Sorcerer Supreme, he created an armor that featured elements of both the Iron Man armor and Doctor Strange's gear. Eventually, Tony would be confronted by Dormammu and his minions. It would then be revealed that Dormammu had healed Strange's hands in exchange for Strange pledging loyalty to him, though Clea would eventually convince Strange to betray Dormammu and help Tony. And so Dormammu was defeated, and Tony Stark continued to be the Sorcerer Supreme, while Strange and Clea moved into the Dark Dimension in order to rule it. This wouldn't be the only time that Tony Stark would become the Sorcerer Supreme, though, an all-new X-Men Annual, released in December of 2014. He's appeared a handful of times since, but he's not the same Sorcerer Supreme Tony from What If. The Original Whiplash So there's a few Whiplashes in the main Marvel continuity. There was one in the Thunderbolts, but she didn't really do anything and appeared only twice, and yet somehow made an appearance in Wolverine and the X-Men. Then there was another Whiplash, who first appeared in Big Hero 6, Issue 1, released in September 2008, and didn't really do anything. And then there's probably the most famous Whiplash, Ivan Venko. But what some Iron Man fans may not realize is that Ivan Venko isn't a very old character. He's not, like, super new, but he first appeared in Iron Man vs. Whiplash, Issue 1, released in December of 2009. This was to hype up Iron Man 2, which came out in April 2010, as that film had Ivan Vanko's Whiplash as its main villain. And despite him being the most well-known Whiplash, he's not the first one, or even the one who has the most appearances. That would be Mark Scalotti, 
who first appeared in Tales of Suspense issue 97, released in October 1967. Mark worked for Stark International and was pretty smart, having a degree in engineering. However, he became a criminal and later a supervillain after befriending some pretty bad dudes, who introduced him to the world of developing weapons for the criminal organization, the Magia. This would eventually lead him into conflict with Iron Man, and after their first battle, he became a regular opponent for the Armored Avenger. That was until he decided to go legit, after being humiliated by Iron Man. But because of his criminal record, nobody wanted to hire him, and his own family even disowned him. So he fell back into crime, and eventually started going by the name Backlash, but would return to being called Whiplash. As mentioned earlier in the video, Whiplash would eventually meet his end at the hands of Iron Man's sentient armor, who beat him to death and then dropped his body into a river. As for Whiplash's abilities, he wore a battle suit capable of stopping small arm fire, electric cybernetic whips that could deflect bullets and pierce steel, and he also had various little gadgets, like discs that could generate an artificial gravity field. Mark's incarnation of Whiplash has appeared in a variety of different media, ranging from Iron Man the Animated Series, Marvel Disc Wars the Avengers, Armored Adventures, Iron Man the Video Game, and even the MCU. Although his name was changed to Marcus Scarlotti, he's not even referred to as Whiplash or Backlash in the single Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode he appears in. Natasha Stark Gender-swapping characters between alternate universes is nothing new. For example, there's been plenty of alternate universes where Batman's been a woman, or Spider-Man's been a woman. And Iron Man is no different. Probably the most well-known female Tony Stark is Natasha Stark from Earth-3490, first and only appearing in Dark Reign Fantastic Four Issue 2, released in April 2009, Natasha has barely any story to her. All we know about her is that she's Iron Woman, and married Captain America. This romantic relationship with him somehow prevented the entirety of Civil War from happening. No, really, because they were so in love, they weren't very aggressive about their beliefs, and so that universe's Reed Richards completed the superhero registration program without a single fight. So with barely any story, it only appearing in one comic, why is she well known? Well, it's because it's an alternate universe Iron Man marrying Captain America, and because of that there's probably been like a million different like nerd articles, like 10 Marvel ships that are actually canon or something like that. Cancelled Avalanche Studios game For around two years, the game studio Avalanche Studios, known for their work on the Just Cause series, the 2015 Mad Max game, and Rage 2, were working on an Iron Man video game. This was revealed by one of Avalanche Studios' founders, Christopher Sundberg, in August of 2022. Not much is known about this cancelled Iron Man game outside of its starting development in 2012, and it was cancelled due to a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons being that Disney had shortened the development time in the game by a year, which increased the budget of the game because Avalanche Studios would need to hire around 80 more people to finish the game in that short period of time. And when the game would be released, the company didn't know where they'd send those 80 new workers. As for the game's gameplay, all we know about it is that it would have been open world, and would have had an emphasis on melee combat. Exo Man. So at least once a year, some tweet or picture or whatever will come out with like the caption, Wow, look at these old Marvel movies. Don't the characters look super weird and old? And it'll be photos of Hulk and Thor from the 70s Hulk show, a picture of either the 1990 Captain America film or the 1979 film, and then there's also like an Iron Man example they usually give. But this photo is not of Iron Man. This wasn't even a Marvel production. These are screenshots from the 1977 made-for-TV film Exo-Man, which was about Professor Nicholas Conrad, who's paralyzed after being attacked by the mob, and so he creates a suit of armor to allow him to walk and fight crime. It was intended to be a pilot for a TV series, 
but the show never ended up happening, apparently because of the lack of merchandising potential. So don't be fooled by these articles or like pictures or whatnot. This is not an Iron Man film or TV show. It is a superhero film from the 1970s, but it's not an Iron Man film. A lot of medieval Iron Men. So because Iron Man is about a guy in a suit of armor, there's been plenty of alternate universe versions of him that have Tony being Iron Man in medieval times. Here's just a few of them. First, we have Tony Stark from Earth 398, who first appeared in Avengers issue 2, released in January of 1998. In this universe, he's known as the Iron Knight. This reality was actually a reality warp created by Morgan Le Fay, with the heroes from the main Marvel Universe possessing the bodies of their medieval counterparts. Although they didn't know they were possessing people, and they thought that they were actually the people they were possessing. It's weird. But when Morgan Le Fay was defeated by the Scarlet Witch, all of the heroes returned to their normal universe. Next we have Tony Stark from Earth 96433, who first appeared in Dark Reign Fantastic Four Issue 2, released in April 2009. Not much is known about him, outside of him starting a revolution against their queen, who's their universe's Sue Storm, and the Captain of the Guard, who's this universe's Captain America. Then there's Tony Stark of Earth-82-633. In this universe, Tony lived his life pretty much the same as his main Marvel Universe counterpart. That is, up until Iron Man issue 150, released in June 1981. You see, in the main universe, Iron Man and Doctor Doom traveled back in time to Camelot, but both of them returned to the present day by the end of the story. However, in What If issue 33, released in March 1982, Doom leaves Tony behind in Camelot, and so Tony is forced to live the rest of his life in medieval times. While there, King Arthur knighted Tony, and he was allowed to be part of the Round Table. Later, Mordred killed King Arthur, and in King Arthur's dying breath, he crowned Tony as the new King of Camelot. And finally, there's Shellhead, who first appeared in Avengers Fairy Tales Issue 1, released in March 2008. I'm really only including Shellhead here for completionist's sake, because I don't really think he counts as an alternate universe version of Tony Stark. Because, like, he, on paper, is. However, by the end of the story, it's revealed that this whole, like, comic series was just a story that the main universe Scarlet Witch is telling. It's basically her version of Peter Pan, with several Marvel characters swapped out for Peter Pan characters. And Shellhead was this universe's Iron Man, who was part of the Lost Boys. Mr. Doll, First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 48, released in September of 1963, Nathan Dolly was a pretty messed up dude who traveled to Africa to learn magic from a witch doctor. There, he discovered a voodoo doll that could rapidly change its shape. He stole it and became the villain, Mr. Doll. He returned to the United States and began to blackmail businessmen into giving him their money, since he could just torture or kill them using the voodoo doll. However, he ended up messing with the wrong person, as one of his victims was a business associate with Tony Stark. The guy started acting pretty weird after being blackmailed by Mr. Dahl. This caused Tony to investigate. He'd eventually find Mr. Dahl and confront him, but would be forced to flee. He would then face off against Mr. Dahl again when he tried to extort Stark Industries. And during this encounter, Tony figured out a way to defeat him. In their third fight, Tony used a beam to change the voodoo doll's appearance to look like Mr. Doll. This hurt Doll Dude pretty badly, and he was arrested. Years later, he'd show back up to fight Spider Woman, this time going by the name Brothers Grimm. He had his mind transferred into two life-size mannequins. These were Brothers Grimm. So his wife attempted to figure out a way to free her husband. She, along with Brothers Grimm, attempted to transfer Nathan's mind into a man named Jerry Hunt, by doing some occult ritual. And during this ritual, while Nathan's soul was traveling to Jerry, Spider-Woman would stop the ritual and save Jerry. Now that there was no host, Nathan's soul passed on, 
and his wife was left sad, knowing that her husband turned doll twins that she treated like her children were now gone. Weird story. Tony's various AI copies. So Tony Stark's made a couple of AI backups of his mind and personality for a variety of reasons. There's the AI who first appeared in Superior Iron Man issue 1, released in November of 2014. This AI copy was created in case Tony suffered a mental attack by the villain the Black Llama. And in order to keep this AI a secret from himself, in case he ever went bad, he erased the memory of him creating it from his mind. Years later, this AI was activated to battle Tony Stark once he became the Superior Iron Man. He faced off against his original self and creator a few times, even releasing an entire army of Iron Man suits to face off against him at one point. During one battle, the AI attempted to get into Tony's mind and to turn him good again, but was destroyed. Kinda. It was forced to retreat into another suit of armor in order to survive. Although it didn't survive for much longer, as shortly after this, the real Tony located the main copy of the AI and forced it to transfer itself into a USB stick. And then he destroyed that USB, destroying the AI. Then there was another AI who first appeared in Iron Man Hypervelocity Issue 1, released in January 2007. It was part of the Model 28 armor which had a contingency plan that if the user of the suit was killed or severely injured, their consciousness would be uploaded into the armor. While testing this armor, Tony was attacked and severely injured, and his consciousness was scanned by the suit. Combined with a beta personality built into the armor based on Tony, this suit was pretty much turned into a Tony Stark AI. And finally, we have the third Tony Stark AI that I actually mentioned earlier. First appearing in Infamous Iron Man Issue 1, released in October 2016, this AI was created in case Tony's body no longer worked, like he was dead or in a coma. And so, after Civil War II, the AI was activated and sent over to Riri Williams to act as her mentor. Though he wouldn't just be her mentor, and would actually fight in the Secret Empire event. After Tony woke up from his coma, the AI version of him would act as his Jarvis, but eventually it would be destroyed when Tony was forced to activate an EMP during a fight, destroying the AI, now dubbed Little Tony. Unicorn, first appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 56, released in August of 1964, Milo Masaryk was a KGB agent working under inventor Anton Vanko. Vanko went on to create two different sets of armor, the Crimson Dynamo armor, and an armor set that was just a radiation beam shooting helmet in a harness called the Unicorn Armor. And shortly after its creation, this Unicorn Armor would be given to Milo to use against the United States, which of course led him into conflict with Iron Man. Eventually, Unicorn would begin working with various supervillains, like Doctor Doom and Count Nefaria. And during his time with each of these villains, he would face off against a variety of heroes, ranging from Iron Man, the X-Men, and the Fantastic Four. But he would mainly be an Iron Man villain. However, while working with these various villains, he was so distracted he failed to report back to the Soviet Union, and so, they began to question his loyalty. So they had him be a test subject for some of their experiments. And when these experiments were done, Milo now had superhuman strength. But there was a tiny little side effect to that experiment. His cells were deteriorating fast. He tried to get help from various villains, like the Mandarin, Titanium Man, and the Red Ghost, but none of them actually helped him, and instead just used him. Funny enough, it would be Iron Man to save his life, finding a cure for his condition. Though by this time, Milo had gone completely insane, and continued to be a villain. Eventually, he didn't even have to wear the laser helmet anymore. Instead, he now had a third eye which fired out the radiation beams. Unicorn's abilities include his superhuman strength, his third eye power beam, and of course, he had the unicorn helmet and harness, which not only gave him the radiation beam, but also gave him the ability 
to lift things with magnetism and create a force field. And he also had a rocket belt. Despite being a classic Iron Man villain, Unicorn has only showed up in one piece of media, that being Armored Avengers. Before I move on to the next entry, I gotta quickly talk about the three other people in the main Marvel timeline who've also taken up the mantle of Unicorn. First appearing in Soviet Super Soldiers, released in September of 1992, Yegor Balinov was part of Remnants 4, a remnant group of the Soviet Union. He faced off against Iron Man and War Machine, got defeated, and never showed up again outside of Hulk Winter Guard, released in December in 2009, which I'm happy about because he's disgusting, as instead of a helmet with a horn or a third eye, he had a tentacle growing out of his head, which fired off laser beams. The next person to take up the mantle was Aiden Blumfield, who first appeared in Iron Man issue 330, released in May 1996. He was a mercenary who attempted to raid Stark Enterprises, under orders from Morgan Stark, Tony's cousin. He showed up twice, and then never again. And finally, we have an as of right now unnamed unicorn, who worked under Hobgoblin and later Green Goblin. He first appeared in Superior Spider-Man issue 26, released in January of 2014. And he hasn't really done too much, though he's apparently going to show up in the series Spider-Man Freshman Year. Roller Skates So very early into Tony Stark's career as Iron Man, he created Roller Skates for the US Army that allowed soldiers to travel up to 60 miles per hour. But Tony didn't want the troops to have all the fun, and so Tony had roller skates built into various different early Iron Man armors. These roller skates, while jet-powered, weren't super useful, though apparently they did charge his armor at points, so that's a plus I guess. You don't really see this armor ability nowadays, but for a time, this was one of Iron Man's iconic abilities. Spy Master First appearing in Iron Man issue 33, released in January of 1971, Spymaster was part of a team of assassins and spies called the Espionage Elite, and was hired by the villain group, the Zodiac. Not the real-life Zodiac killer, although that would be pretty interesting. He was hired to break into Stark Industries and steal all of Tony Stark's secrets. After failing, he would be told by Zodiac to hunt down Daredevil instead, and eventually Iron Man, Daredevil, Nick Fury, and Madame Mask all teamed up to battle Spymaster and the Zodiac. After this storyline, Spymaster would become a recurring villain for Iron Man, even killing a life model decoy of Tony Stark at one point. Eventually, after faking his own death, Spymaster would be hired by Norman Osborn to steal a photo of Tony Stark's family, something that Tony Stark treasured. Once he stole it and gave it to Norman, Norman just burned it. Later, Spymaster would have a team of villains break into Stark Tower to steal some tech. However, he double-crossed them and revealed he was working with Atlas, a Kree captain. Now, Spymaster had an entire army of Iron Man armors. He even wore a Hulkbuster suit. But then everything went wrong. Iron Man showed up, and the villains that Spymaster had betrayed escaped custody, and he would eventually be killed by Blizzard. As for Spymaster's abilities, he didn't have any powers, but instead was an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He also had various gadgets, like devices that could fire concussive energy blasts, missiles, razor discs, stun guns, sleeping gas, he also had some jet boots, and electric nunchucks. Now this wasn't the only Spymaster. As in the main Marvel Universe, there's been four of them. The second was a man named Mark Sharon, who first appeared in Iron Man issue 220, released in April 1987, and he died. That's it. You see, originally, Mark wasn't even a character. This was supposed to be the original Spymaster. However, years later, it would be retconned that Spymaster had faked his death. So, Mark Sharon was retconned into being that Spymaster who died in that issue. So, Mark is pretty much just a retcon character, 
and barely counts as an actual spy master. Then there's the real second spy master, Nathan Lemon, who first appeared in Iron Man issue 254, released in January of 1990. He was a student of the Taskmaster and took up the mantle of Spymaster once the original had faked his death. And he also dressed up as Santa Claus at one point to attack Tony Stark at a Christmas party. Now, he didn't really appear that often and was actually killed off-panel by the next Spymaster, Sinclair Abbott, who first appeared in Iron Man Inevitable Issue 1, released in December 2005. Sinclair had Lemon arrested, beaten almost to death in prison, and then killed in intensive care by Lemon's own wife. This spymaster prefers to have others do his dirty work, like sending Ghost after Tony and playing mind games with him. Probably the most notable thing that he's done was kill Happy Hogan. He then committed Avengers Endgame Yourself by cop, so uh, that's pretty wacky. Only the original Spymaster has ever appeared in anything outside the comics. And surprisingly, it wasn't in any Iron Man media. Instead, he appeared in the 1980s Incredible Hulk cartoon, Tony's Nose Armor, from Iron Man issue 68, released in March 1974, to Iron Man issue 85, released in January 1976, Tony wore an Iron Man mask that had a nose on it. There's been rumors that this design decision was from Stan Lee himself, who saw a cover of Iron Man and said that he should have a nose, since it would be pretty hard for Tony to wear a mask without one. Then, almost two years later, Stan Lee would see another comic and say, the nose looks stupid, so they got rid of it. In universe, he gave the helmet a nose because he thought it gave it more expression, and he also thought it looked fearsome to his enemies. Iron Hammer First appearing in Infinity Wars Issue 3, released in September of 2018, Stark Odinson was created by Gamora. You see, Gamora had recently sealed every single soul in the Marvel Universe within the Soul Stone, and then merged all the souls together creating a pocket dimension called Warp World. As his name suggests, he's a combination between Thor and Iron Man. Stark wanted to be a warrior that served Asgard, but his dad, Howard Odin, said, Dude, you're like immortal. You got some serious arrogance. No, you're not going to be a warrior. They got into a fight, and Stark was stripped of his godhood and sent down to Earth where Stark would become the fifth richest man in Europe within just five years of exile. While there, he'd be captured by Malekith and the Dark Elves, and while their prisoner, Stark, alongside another prisoner, built a suit of armor for him to escape, he regained his godhood and hunted down Malekith, and would eventually become romantically involved with Madame Hell, a combination between Madame Mask and Hela. He'd also eventually join the Defenders, a group of superheroes sworn to defend Warp World. So yeah, they just took the backstories of Thor and Iron Man and then smushed them together. As for Iron Hammer's abilities, his armor has a Jarvis system in it called Heimdall that allows him to see even if he's blinded. The suit is also a combination between technology and magic, so it has extreme durability and his hammer is known as Mjolniron, which is basically just Thor's hammer, but bigger. Titanium Man First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 69, released in June 1965, Boris Bolsky was an agent of the Soviet Union who was determined to prove to the world that the Soviet Union was superior to the United States and he wanted to do this by creating his own armor to defeat Iron Man, and so he created a suit made of titanium alloy at a Siberian labor camp he was put in charge of. When he completed the armor, he was allowed to fight Iron Man in a televised fight, and lost. But he didn't give up, he got in shape, and by that I mean he had medical experiments done on him to make him stronger and taller. He then redesigned his Titanium Man armor, and lost again. After this, the Soviet Union kicked him out, 
and so he began working for Vietnam, though he would eventually return to the Soviet Union and continue battling Iron Man for years and years. And when the Soviet Union eventually collapsed and Stark Enterprises created a branch in Russia, he became a mercenary, even eventually taking a job for Tony Stark to attack the United States Congress in order to show Congress the Superhuman Registration Act was bad. Though he'd be stopped by Spider-Man, but would eventually work under Spider-Man and Silver Sable to infiltrate a missile silo owned by Doc Ock. As for Titanium Man's powers, he's got superhuman strength even without the armor. As for the Titanium Man armor, that gives Boris superhuman speed, strength, reflexes, etc. It also allows him to fly and has various weapons built into it, like energy beams, eye beams, a tractor beam, magnetic flux rings, and a holographic cloaking device. Also, like a lot of Iron Man villains, there's been multiple Titanium Men. There's Gennady Ovenik, who first appeared in Iron Man Legacy Issue 4, released in July 2010. He worked for the Russian government, and he was actually a good guy, trying to protect Russia from some hijacked Iron Man armors. Then there's Kondrati Topolov, who first appeared in Incredible Hulk issue 163. He was originally a villain called Gremlin, who became Titanium Man to fight off against Iron Man during the Armor Wars. And finally, there's Atlas, who first appeared in Quasar issue 9, released in February 1990. He took up the mantle of Titanium Man to work with Spymaster to do that heist I mentioned earlier. He was then killed by Unicorn. The original Titanium Man has appeared in a ton of media, like Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2, Superhero Squad Online, Iron Man the Animated Series, Armored Adventures, and Iron Man the Video Game. Cancelled Iron Man Films The original Iron Man film, released in 2008, was the result of an 18-year-long development hell. It went through various different directors, like Quentin Tarantino, Nick Cassavetes, and Joss Whedon. It also went through various different scripts. Some of these various cancelled Iron Man scripts include one created by Jeff Fitter and Stan Lee, which had MODOK as the main villain, though a rewrite would have Alexander Pierce be the main villain, and Iron Man would have a sci-fi origin. There would also be a variety of other superheroes in the film, this was in the late 1990s, and Tom Cruise had been expressing his interest in producing and starring in the film. Then there was a script written in 1999 by Tom Elliott, Tim McKenleys, and Terry Rossio. This script had Nick Fury appear in the film to set up his own solo film, and then there was a script written by Alfred Goff, Miles Miller, and David Hayter. This script had Iron Man battling War Machine, who was Howard Stark. This script and the ones I mentioned before were all rejected, and eventually we got 2008's Iron Man. Bethany Cabe First appearing in Iron Man issue 117, released in September of 1978, Bethany Cabe dated Tony Stark for a while, though Tony wasn't her first serious relationship. She had once been married to a man named Alexander Van Tilburg, and they had a very complicated relationship, as he became a drug addict and died in a car crash, causing her to feel pretty bad, to put it lightly. Then, years later, it turns out that he's actually alive, and was just a prisoner in East Germany. She then had herself arrested to plan his escape. Tony then showed up to free her, and while escaping, they did free Alexander, but it turned out that he was in a coma. But he did get better, but then fell back into drugs. At this point in time, Bethany was in love with Tony Stark, but felt obligated to stay with Alexander. Though that didn't last very long, as she would eventually decide to divorce him. But then he got murdered by some drug dealers. And all of that really did not help Bethany's mental state. So, why am I talking about her? It just seems like she's one of Iron Man's many past girlfriends, except with a really tragic love life. Well, I'm talking about her because for a short period of time, she was known as Iron Woman. 
You see, when the villain Ultimo defeated Iron Man, Bethany, Rhodey, Happy Hogan, and a bunch of other Iron Man associated characters teamed up and wore a bunch of Iron Man armors to defeat him. And they did. That wouldn't be the last time she'd use an Iron Man armor, though. Years later, she would take up the mantle of War Machine and help Rhodey in various battles. Blizzard Every superhero needs a villain whose powers are ice or snow-related. Flash has Captain Cold, Batman has Mr. Freeze, Spider-Man has... Uh, Superman has... Uh, okay, maybe, maybe not all of them have to, but it's a common superpower. First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 45, released in June 1963, Gregor Shapanka was an employee of Stark Industries, who was trying to discover the secret to immortality. In order to get funds to help with his research, Gregor attempted to rob Tony Stark's vault to steal tech to sell. He failed and was fired. He then created a suit that created freezing temperatures. His plan was for this suit to slow his aging, and he used this suit to help commit crimes to gather funds for his research. That's when he took up the name Jack Frost and captured Pepper Potts and Happy Hogan, seeking revenge on Tony for firing him. But then Iron Man showed up, beat him, and then got sent to prison. A few years go by, and Gregor changes his supervillain name to Blizzard and created a more powerful suit. And for a while, he would become a recurring Iron Man villain, using his freeze powers to battle him. That was until he found out that he accidentally gave himself the ability to generate intense cold with just his body, and because of this, he couldn't exactly live in a normal society, so depressed, he fled to an ice palace he created in a snowy mountain to live the rest of his life in solitude, nowhere near people. Basically, think Elsa from Frozen. Then Hulk showed up and destroyed his palace. And eventually, he would be killed by Iron Man 2020, who traveled to the main Marvel timeline. As mentioned earlier, Blizzard had the ability to create freezing temperatures with not just his suit, but also his body. He could also fire off ice, snow, and sleet using devices in his suit. As for appearances in media outside the comics, Gregor's only appeared in the Marvel superheroes. But, say it with me now, that wasn't the only guy who went by the name Blizzard. First appearing in Iron Man issue 223, released in July of 1987, Donald Gill is easily the most well-known Blizzard. His backstory is pretty simple. He was a criminal who had been given a replica of the Blizzard suit by Justin Hammer. But despite his simple origins, Donald has had a pretty crazy history. He's worked under MODOK, joined the Thunderbolts, had drinks with She-Hulk, killed the Spymaster, covered the Great Wall of China with ice, and worked with Korvac, who was trying to become a god. He's also an Inhuman, as for his inhuman powers, Donald has the ability to manipulate electrical currents, and can set off a small EMP. And of course, there's the Blizzard suit, which gives him pretty much the same abilities as Gregor. As for appearances outside the comics, Donnie has a ton of appearances, ranging from Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Armored Adventures, Iron Man the Animated Series, Disc Wars the Avengers, Invincible Iron Man, and even the MCU. Yeah, he was actually a supporting villain in two episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Then there's Randall Macklin, who's only ever appeared in Marvel Holiday Special 1992, released in November of 1992. After being released from prison, Randall was given a job by Donald Gill to protect the Blizzard suit. But instead of just, like, laying low, Randall took the suit and attempted to fight Iron Man. And after briefly fighting Iron Man, Tony offers him a job at Stark Industries, where I assume he works to this day. If any Iron Man writer watches this video, can you please just have Randall Macklin show up in the background at Stark Industries or something? Thank you. Although he actually has appeared in one piece of media outside the comics, Marvel's Spider-Man of all things. 
Then there's Mickey Quaid, who first appeared in Silver Sable in the Wild Pack, issue 29, released in February 1994. He got the Blizzard suit from Justin Hammer, and is such a minor, obscure, nothing character that he doesn't even have a page on the Marvel Wiki. Basically, he got the suit, fought the Wild Pack, lost, and never showed up again. And finally, we have Jim. First appearing in Iron Man issue 510, released in November 2011, Jim was given ice powers by the Mandarin and Ezekiel Stain. He was then sent off to remove all the water in the United Arab Emirates, with a bomb placed inside of him that would go off in case he refused to do the mission. Later, Tony Stark would convince him and some other villains to betray the Mandarin, so they worked with him, but Jim would be killed in this revolution. The Wakanda Hulkbuster First appearing in Totally Awesome Hulk, Issue 9, released in July 2016, T'Challa had created this Hulkbuster in order to defeat the Hulk, in case he ever went out of control. Basically the same reason as Tony. However, it was never actually used against the Hulk. Well, Bruce Banner Hulk. Amadeus Cho had recently become the Hulk, and was having a bit of a wacky time. So T'Challa used this Hulkbuster armor to calm him down. Unlike Tony's Hulkbuster armors, T'Challa's doesn't have any lethal weaponry, and is more like Pepper's rescue armor, as it uses sound waves to mess with Hulk's focus. It also could release spores that caused people to fall asleep. Despite his non-lethal approach seeming pretty effective, it was eventually destroyed by Cho, which is pretty crazy because this Hulkbuster was made of vibranium. Also, despite the clear inspiration from Tony's Hulkbuster armors, T'Challa's Hulkbuster armor had no Stark tech involved. It was purely Wakandan made, though it's no longer in Wakanda. The rebuilt Wakanda Hulkbuster is currently being held in Avengers Mountain. Iron Lad Nathaniel Richards, aka Iron Lad, first appeared in Young Avengers Issue 1, released in February 2005. He's not actually related to Iron Man all that much, but I'm including him here because his armor was inspired by Iron Man, and his name is Iron Lad, so whatever. Nathaniel comes from an alternate universe and arrived in the main Marvel timeline in order to prevent himself from becoming Kang the Conqueror. Probably should have mentioned that. Yeah, Iron Lad is actually an alternate universe version of Kang. And by alternate universe Kang, I mean he is Kang, but like Kang from the past, like like all the alternate like, pretty much every Kang of the main Marvel Universe that's appeared is the same person. Like, it's the same Kang, just from different periods of time. It's weird and confusing. I... It's just odd. Anyways, Nathaniel found out about his future as Kang after his future self traveled to his dimension to save Nathaniel from a bully who was about to murder him. Kang would then show Nathaniel the future, seeing him fight the Avengers... He had hoped that this would, like, inspire him to start conquering early, but instead, Nathaniel was disgusted and furious. He used the armor given to him by Kang to then travel back in time to another dimension, the main Marvel Universe, to have the Avengers protect him. Upon arriving in this universe, Nathaniel downloaded Vision's memories and discovered that the Avengers were disbanded, so that plan went out the window. But he also found out that Vision had a plan in place to create a new team of Avengers, in case the main team was disbanded or killed. This was the Young Avengers Initiative, and so Nathaniel located all of the Young Avengers candidates that Vision had listed and created the team, reconstructing his armor to look like an Iron Man armor, and taking up the mantle of Iron Lad. During his time with the Young Avengers, Nathaniel would fall in love with Cassie Lang, aka Stature. The two, alongside the rest of the Young Avengers, would go on a bunch of missions, until Kang the Conqueror showed up. Kang battled the heroes for a bit, until he was eventually killed, and then Nathaniel realized that he had to go back into the future and become Kang, because his presence in the present was causing history to become altered. 
so he went back to the future and continued to monitor the Young Avengers. There in the future, he would do some timeline stuff and work with other Kangs to undo damage done by other Kangs in other dimensions. Iron Lad's a bit of a tragic character, though, because he's going to become Kang the Conqueror. He's going to become evil at some point. That's his future. We don't know how or why he becomes evil, but it will happen. As for Iron Lad's abilities, his armor allows him to travel through time, fire off energy blasts from his hands, create weapons depending on Nathaniel's emotions, the ability to fly, and communicate with people regardless of where they are on the timeline. Iron Lad has only appeared in one piece of media outside the comics. That being Marvel Avengers Academy. I'm honestly really surprised he didn't show up in Quantumania. I mean, not only does Cassie Lang become stature in that movie, Kang's properly introduced, and there was a scrapped after credits scene that showed Cassie finding the Young Avengers initiative. Oh well, I'm pretty sure that we'll see Iron Lad at the MCU within the next five years. Ready your armor. We'll be right back to Iron Man on Disney XD. Honey, what are you doing? I am Iron Man. That's right. I'm unstoppable. You can discover your own power at Burger King with Iron Man toys from the new movie. Six in all, one toy in every kid's meal. It's hot as an oven in here. Iron Man toys are now at BK. Blast off. Now back to Iron Man right here on Disney XD. Armored Adventures Season 3 Iron Man Armored Adventures only lasted two seasons, although, according to story editor Brandon Allman, there were plans for a third season. Now, the cast and the crew of the show didn't actually think that they would get a third season, but they did have ideas for what it would have been if it did happen. According to Amon, the third season would primarily focus on Tony, Rhodey, and Pepper juggling their lives between college, their day-to-day -day lives, and their superhero lives, all while the public know their true identities. The Fantastic Four, Thor, Captain America, and Wolverine were all also considered for potential team-up guest episodes. And the Raiders, the Mauler, the Skrulls, and Galactus were being considered for villains. Original Casting So in the MCU Iceberg, I mentioned that Tom Cruise was in talks to play Iron Man, but I failed to mention the other actors who were almost casted as the Armored Avenger, and his supporting cast. So here's a few actors who either auditioned for the role, or considered for the role. For Iron Man himself, there was Sam Rockwell, Rob Lowe, Clive Owen, Nicolas Cage, Leonardo DiCaprio, Hugh Jackman, and Timothy Oliphant. For War Machine, there was Don Cheadle. No, really, Don Cheadle was approached to play Rhodey in Iron Man 1. He didn't get the role then, but uh, since then, he's played Rhodey a lot. For Pepper Potts, there was Rachel McAdams. For Justin Hammer, there was Al Pacino. For Howard Stark, there was Tim Robbins. For Maya Hansen, there was Jessica Chastain, Gemma Arteton, Diane Kruger, and Isla Fisher. For Aldrich Killian, there was Jude Law. For the Mandarin, or Trevor, there was Anthony Mackie. And finally, for the real Mandarin in Shang-Chi, there was Donnie Yen. War Widow. First appearing in Avengers issue 28, Released in December 2019, the War Widow armor was a War Machine armor built exclusively for Black Widow. Created by Tony Stark, not because there was some like big mission that Black Widow had to go on. No, in fact, he just kinda made it for her, and it stayed in Avengers mounted in storage for a while. Imagine your friend comes over and tells you that they made you a War Machine armor. Anyways, Natasha would eventually wear the armor while doing a mission to locate the newest Star Brand who wasn't even born yet. Basically, it's like a tattoo-like thing that appears on people and gives them godlike powers. There was actually a T-Rex once with a Starband powers, so that's pretty cool. 
Anyways, Natasha used the War Widow armor on her mission, which a uh, good thing she did because on this mission, she had to confront Silver Surfer and fight a bunch of scrolls. Sadly, the War Widow armor hasn't actually appeared very often, only in this story arc. As for its abilities, the armor allows Natasha to fly and have enhanced strength. Also, it has a ton of weapons, like a tri-barrel rocket launcher, repulsor blasts, missile launchers, and six of these weird energy beam appendages that kind of remind me of that weird thing that Mayfield had in that one Mandalorian episode. Detroit Steel First appearing in Invincible Iron Man issue 25, released in April 2010, Doug Johnson III was a U.S. Army veteran working for Justin Hammer and was chosen to pilot a new suit of armor created by Hammer Industries called the Detroit Steel Armor, although he'd have to undergo surgery to use this armor. Upon becoming Detroit Steel, he was sent on a variety of rescue missions to save civilians from attacks and disasters Justin Hammer had set up. He did all this because he wanted to prove to the world that the Detroit Steel armor was far superior than the Iron Man armor. Hammer also hoped to mass produce these armors as well and sell them across the world. Hammer wasn't just satisfied with Detroit Steel saving civilians. At one point, he orchestrated an attack on Tony Stark's newest company, Stark Resilient. This attack was led by Detroit Steel and backed up by a bunch of gamers who thought they were playing a video game, but in reality they were controlling drones based on the Detroit Steel armor. This attack would fail, and Detroit Steel would be defeated by Iron Man, War Machine, and Rescue. Later, he would be sent on a mission to Paris to battle the villain Mach, aka the Grey Gargoyle. Doug didn't really do too well in this mission, and was killed, being turned to stone. But then Odin brought everyone who Mach turned to stone back to life, so Doug was alive again. Although his family and Hammer Industries thought he was dead. Sasha Hammer, Justin Hammer's granddaughter, was then chosen to become the new Detroit Steel, and used a new suit of armor to battle Mach in Paris. Now without the Detroit Steel armor, Doug ended up stalking Sasha and eventually forced her to give him back the Detroit Steel armor. But he didn't have it back for very long, as he would be decapitated by her. As for Detroit Steel's abilities, it had a giant minigun and a giant chainsaw weapon mounted to its arms. The suit also allowed Doug to fly and fire energy weapons like a chest beam. As for its appearances outside the comics, Detroit Steel has appeared in LEGO Marvel's Avengers and kinda Avengers Assemble. EA Motive Iron Man So in September 2022, it was revealed by EA that they had partnered with Marvel to create an Iron Man video game. This game is being made by EA Motive, the team behind the 2023 Dead Space remake and Star Wars Squadrons. The only things we know about this game are that it's going to be a single-player game, and it's been described as unique, compared to the other Marvel video games released in the past few years, like Spider-Man, Midnight Suns, Guardians of the Galaxy, Ultimate Alliance 3, and of course, Avengers. The Model 58 First appearing in Tony Stark Iron Man Issue 1, released in June 2018, the Model 58 armor is a series of Iron Man armors that are extremely small. They're practically microscopic. These suits were created by Tony Stark in order to fly into people's bodies. But he doesn't shrink down like Ant-Man to use them, he controls them via computer. For example, he used these suits to destroy a control disc lodged in Fing Fang Foom's brainstem. He also used these to travel inside his own body to separate himself from the Ultron Buster armor he'd become bonded to. More on that later. The Model 58 armor works in groups of thousands and are equipped with repulsor blasts. Anime Iron Man's appeared in various different anime over the years. First, he started a 12-episode anime titled Marvel Anime Iron Man, which ran from January of 2011 to March of the same year. This series had Iron Man traveling to Japan to create a new power station, also to reveal to the world the Iron Man Dio armor. Insert Jojo joke here. Get back, Jojo! No! This armor is supposed to replace Tony once he retires. 
although it goes berserk and teams up with the Zodiac Gang. Ho Yinsen also appears in this series, although he's evil and he uses the Dio armor to battle Tony. So Iron Man's gotta fight them with the help from his friend Nagato Sakurai, a JSDF soldier who wears the Roman Zero Iron Man armor. This series was the first installment in the Marvel anime franchise, a shared continuity that included the Iron Man anime, along with an X-Men anime, a Blade anime, and a Wolverine anime. There were also two different anime films set in this continuity, such as Iron Man, Rise of Technovore, and Avengers Confidential, Black Widow, and Punisher. Iron Man would appear in both of these films, and would even make a non-speaking cameo in the X-Men anime. Marvel would then go on to produce a couple more anime projects, like Marvel Disc Wars, The Avengers, and Marvel Future Avengers, and Iron Man appears in both of these, although these shows are set in completely different continuities. Dread Knight First appearing in Iron Man, issue 101, released in May 1977, Bram Velsing was a scientist working for Doctor Doom. However, he wasn't really a big fan of Doctor Doom's take-over-the-world, killing-people schemes, and so when Doom found out about that, he did what anyone named Doctor Doom would do. He had a metal mask fused to Bram's face. After this, Bram fled Latveria, because obviously he would, who wouldn't? and would eventually end up living with Victoria Frankenstein, the great-granddaughter of Dr. Frankenstein, in Yugoslavia. There, he would meet Black Knight's flying horse. Bram would team up with the horse and dub himself the Dread Knight. As Dread Knight, he plans on killing Dr. Doom, but first, he needed to steal Frankenstein's secrets. But then Iron Man showed up and beat him in a fight. And that was pretty much his only interaction with Iron Man until Iron Man Legacy Issue 3, released in June 2010, where it's revealed he's working for Doctor Doom again, for some reason. He hasn't really shown up all that much, but when he has, he usually fights heroes that aren't Iron Man, like Spider-Man, Silver Sable, the Wild Pack, and of course, Black Knight. But he first appeared in an Iron Man story, so I'm putting him in the iceberg. Side note, in one of Marvel's many handbooks, it's revealed that Dread Knight was a member of the Masters of Evil, despite him literally never appearing with them in any comic or story. In fact, in the Masters of Evil's entry in that guidebook, he wasn't even listed as a member. As for Dread Knight's abilities, he doesn't have any powers, it instead relies on the Dread Knight armor, a knight-like armor that gives him protection against most weapons. He's also got a lance he designed that has a bunch of weapons built into it, like an electrical entanglement cable, armor-piercing bullets, and twin force blast pods. He also has a gun that fires knockout gas. I guess when he has to reload the lance, he switches to his sidearm because it's faster than reloading. Corporal Dunn would be proud. Dread Knight has also appeared in media outside the comics, like Iron Man the Animated Series, and kinda Armored Adventures? These stone statue monsters are called Dread Knights, so like, I, I don't, I don't know, does that count? Cancelled 1980s Iron Man cartoon? In the early 1980s, Marvel wanted to create some cartoons based on some of their characters. And so, a bunch of writers and artists created pitches for cartoons. And one of these was about Iron Man. This artwork was created to pitch an Iron Man TV show. And, uh, that's it. That's all we know about the show. This art comes from the magazine Comics Features Issue 33. And this magazine also shows off a bunch of other cartoons Marvel wanted to make. Like an Ant-Man the Wasp show. A Daredevil show where he'd have a super dog named Lightning. Teen Hulk. Hulk Hound and the Monstrous, which I can only imagine was made because somebody had a giantess fetish. Iron Man making suits for other heroes. So everyone knows about War Machine, Rescue, and, and the Iron Spider armor. And now you know about the War Widow armor. But there's actually been a few other Iron Man armors that Tony's made for other heroes. For example, in Hunt for Wolverine, issue 3, released in July 2018, Tony Stark, X-23, Jessica Jones, Spider-Man, and Luke Cage were trying to find Wolverine's corpse, uh, because he was dead at the time. Don't worry though, he's back. 
and during the search, they had to infiltrate Mr. Sinister's base, located in the Desolation Islands. So in order to even the odds against Mr. Sinister, Tony built new Iron Man armors for Jessica Jones, X-23, Luke Cage, and Spider-Man. So yeah, Spider-Man's had two different Iron Man armors in the main Marvel timeline. I wonder if this will show up in Spider-Man 2. Anyways, these armors had pretty much your standard Iron Man abilities, although there were some changes. For example, Spidey's armor had built-in web shooters, and Luke Cage had a spiked wrecking ball. These armors appeared twice, and then never again. There was also Captain America's exoskeleton. This was an Iron Man light armor that first appeared in Captain America issue 438, released in April 1995. As around this time, Steve's Super Soldier Serum was starting to go away and give him some medical problems, such as a heart attack that left him completely paralyzed. So, being a nice friend, Tony created an exoskeleton to allow Steve to move around and fight crime again. This armor had several non-lethal weapons built into the suit, such as magnetic gloves, beams that caused people to suffer from vertigo, and anti-missile missiles. Also, Captain America, while wearing this armor, was actually bonded with a symbiote for a short period of time. Gargantuous the Alien Caveman Robot First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 40, released in January of 1963, Gargantuous is pretty much only known for being Iron Man's very first villain. In fact, he's only ever appeared in this issue. Gargantuous was created by an alien race, that by the way is still unnamed to this day, and these aliens scouted out Earth 80,000 years ago. And because of this, they knew what cavemen looked like, created, and so they created a robot called Gargantuous that was designed after a caveman. Makes sense to me. They sent out this robot to terrorize Earth, but Iron Man just so happened to be in the city that Gargantuous had been invading, so Tony suited up as Iron Man and took him out pretty easily. Gargantuous's abilities include a giant club, because caveman, superhuman strength, because robot, and beams of energy that mind control people, because alien. Tony Ho First appearing in New Avengers Issue 1, released in October 2015, Tony Ho hated Tony Stark, as when she was only 11 years old, Iron Man failed to save her father and so she swore that she would become better than him. She would eventually find herself working for the Avengers idea mechanics. There, she would begin to study Pod, a sentient suit of armor that had merged with a Finnish-Norwegian girl named Aiku Jokinen. While studying Pod, the base that she was working at was then attacked by the villain, Maker. In order to survive, Tony suited up in a rescue armor and fought back against the villain. During the attack, she thought that Aiku was killed, but it turns out that she survived the attack and was now outside of Pod in some kind of weird undersuit. Later, the two would become a couple, and Aiku would start going by the superhero name, Enigma. Tony would also be allowed to keep the rescue armor, but she would eventually abandon it in favor of becoming the new Iron Patriot. She'd fight crime and save people as Iron Patriot for a while, until Enigma pointed out that Tony wasn't eating or sleeping because of her obsession with her research. And the Iron Patriot armor had weapons that blurred the line between non-lethal and lethal. This caused Tony to retire from being Iron Patriot altogether, though she wouldn't stop fighting and helping people, as she continued to work with various hero groups as a tech expert or engineer. As for Tony's abilities, she's a genius and an expert engineer. As for her various Iron Patriot armors that she wore, she had various non-lethal weapons, like gas pellets, microsonic attacks, stun guns, force fields, and these armors all allowed her to fly. There were also two different heavy combat versions of the Iron Patriot armor that she would occasionally wear, and one of them had a shoulder-mounted concussion blast cannon, she also had a stealth suit that was a skin-tight exosuit that allowed her to create force fields. As for appearances outside the comics, she's only appeared in Avengers Assemble, but weirdly, she's not Iron Patriot or Rescue. She's Iron Woman. 
Firebrand. First appearing in Iron Man issue 27, released in July 1970, Gary Gilbert was a political activist alongside his sister. He really hated evil businesses, and so became extremely radical and started planning a revolution to overthrow the US government and capitalism. And in order to do all this, he joined Stark Industries to create the Firebrand suit, a suit that allowed him to shoot out fire. His first outing as Firebrand had him trying to stop the creation of a community center. He fought Iron Man over it, but it turned out that the community center was actually being built by a councilman who had criminal motivations behind building it. Side note, you're not seeing things. Firebrand has the black power symbol on his costume. Yeah, Firebrand's a pretty wacky character. He is extremely politically charged, at least in his early appearances, as they would eventually drop a lot of the political aspects of him. He would eventually quit being Firebrand and become an alcoholic, though he'd still work for villains. Eventually, he'd be killed by the villain Scourge, though he would later be resurrected by the Hood, where he would be forced to burn Punisher's newly resurrected family alive. Toasty! A Punisher then killed him. As for his abilities, Firebrand's suit gave him superhuman strength, the ability to fly, and he had flamethrowers built into it. And just like a bunch of other Iron Man villains, there's been a bunch of Firebrands over the years. Like Firebrand 4, who only appeared in Deadpool issue 27, released in April 2014. He also had the black power symbol on his costume, but his name was never revealed, and he died almost instantly. There's Russell Broxtell, who first appeared in Web of Spider-Man issue 77, released in June 1991. He was a janitor at Stark Industries, who stole the designs for the original Firebrand's costume and weapons. He then replicated them and started doing crime, but he'd eventually die. Then there's Richard Dennison, who first appeared in Iron Man issue 4, released in March 1998. Richard was an eco-terrorist, who accidentally got caught up in one of his own explosions. The explosion launched him into a tank filled with supercharged plasma, and by the power of comic books, not only did he survive, but he was turned into a living plasma monster that could fire off plasma beams. Then there's Amanda, who first appeared in Iron Man issue 513, released in February of 2012. She was hired by the Mandarin as part of an army of villains. She would work with him for a little bit, but after his death, she would leave the Mandarin's army and become a mercenary, and fought Iron Man a couple times. She would also be part of that villain heist on Stark Tower by Spymaster that I've mentioned like twice before. She can fire off blasts of energy, and using these blasts, she can also fly. And finally, we have Erickson Hades, who first appeared in Great Lakes Avengers Issue 1, released in October 2016. He hasn't really done anything of note outside of being hired by Dick Snurd. A very unfortunate name. He seems to have the same powers as the Richard Dennison version of Firebrand. Firebrands actually appeared in a few pieces of media outside the comics, the original appearing in Iron Man the Animated Series, while a version inspired by the Richard Dennison Firebrand was seen in Armored Adventures. 1602 First appearing in Marvel 1602 New World Issue 2, released in August 2005, this is an Iron Man from a different universe where the Marvel heroes were all alive during the 17th century. Anthony Stark was captured during the English and Spanish War and was forced to create weapons, all while being tortured by David Banner. This universe is Hulk. Anthony was forced to live the rest of his life in an enormous suit of armor, as without this electrical suit, he would die. He would eventually be called upon by King James to find David Banner, as he had gone missing in the New World, America. Anthony swore that he would kill Banner if he had betrayed the king. Also, he wanted to get revenge for being tortured. And so, he was sent on his way across the Atlantic Ocean to America to locate Banner. He would eventually find him, and they would battle it out, until a girl named Virginia Dare transformed into a Sphinx, and threatened to eat everyone if they didn't stop fighting. She was from the Lost Roanoke Colony, although in this universe, the Roanoke Colony never vanished. 
She had also come into contact with some weird rift thing that gave her the power to transform into any animal she wishes. When the fighting was over, Anthony Stark, who was going by the name Lord Iron, made amends with David Banner, and the two decided to live out the rest of their lives in Roanoke. Lord Iron's abilities include various electrical attacks, along with a big sword and a big pistol. Iron Lantern First appearing in Iron Lantern Issue 1, released in April of 1997, Harold Stark, aka Hal Stark, is one of Marvel and DC's crossover characters. This was an event going on at the time, where Marvel and DC had many of their characters merge into other characters. For example, Batman and Wolverine, Captain America and Superman, Superboy and Ben Reilly Spider-Man, etc. Iron Lantern was the combination between Tony Stark, Iron Man, and Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. Hal was the founder of Stark Aircraft, and one day came into contact with a crashed alien ship after the flight simulator he was in took off without warning and crashed nearby. Because of the crash, Shrapnel was stuck in his chest. Despite being fatally wounded, he decided to make his way to the spaceship, where he found a dying alien. Hal then created a suit of armor made from the alien's technology, and used a battery found in the ship to power the suit up. And that's how he became the Iron Lantern. He fought against a variety of different supervillains, like Madame Sapphire, Great White, and the Mandarin Estro. As for his powers, Iron Lantern has your standard Iron Man and Green Lantern abilities. He can fly, create objects out of energy, fire off a unibeam chest laser, he has super strength, and can translate any language in the galaxy. Tony Stark works for Kang the Conqueror. In 1995, Marvel wanted to redefine and rebrand Iron Man, so they revealed that he was a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror. This took place in the Crossing event, which is widely regarded as one of the, if not the, worst Iron Man storylines ever. It was hated so much that it was practically retconned out of existence one year later. So why is this story hated? It's revealed that when the Avengers fought Kang for the first time, Tony was turned into a double agent for Kang. And so, for 30 years, Iron Man has actually been a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror. And in the crossing event, Kang activates the sleeper agent program, and Tony's instantly going off killing some heroes, like Rita Damara, the Yellow Jacket from the future. And that's when the Avengers decided to bring in Team Tony, who I talked about ages ago. Team Tony loses the fight against Iron Man, but somehow knocks him out of Kang's mind control, and Iron Man sacrifices his life to save Team Tony and to defeat Kang. Marvel's Scarecrow First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 51, released in December of 1963, Ebenezer Lafton worked at a circus as the Rubber Man as he was extremely flexible and was able to twist his body into weird and gross positions. He was also like an acrobat and stuff. His job as the Rubber Man would lead him to meet Iron Man, as the Armored Avenger entered where he was working to chase after a criminal. Ebenezer would then stop the criminal, and Iron Man thanked him. But this incident made him realize that his abilities could be used to commit crimes. And so, he became the villain Scarecrow. Although, decades later, it would be retconned that the Mandarin had given Ebenezer the Scarecrow costume and influenced him to become a villain. And yes, DC has their own Scarecrow, who was actually created first in September of 1941. This has led many to call Scarecrow a ripoff. But he's really not a ripoff, as he just has the same name and they both dress up as Scarecrows. They have completely different origins and backgrounds. But anyways, Scarecrow attempted to rob Tony Stark, and while robbing him, he found some pretty interesting designs and plans for weapons. And because this was the early 1960s, he tried to sell these plans to the Cuban military. But Iron Man stopped him, so Scarecrow couldn't commit treason. Anyways, after this, he would stop being an Iron Man villain, and instead become a villain for the wider Marvel Universe as he fought against the X-Men, Captain America, Spider-Man, Hawkeye, and even Ghost Rider. As for his abilities, Scarecrow uses a pitchfork. He also secretes an odorless pheromone 
that can trigger panic attacks. This pheromone also gives him superhuman strength, speed, and stamina for some reason. He's also got a bunch of crows that he uses to steal stuff and do some epic crimes. As for his appearances in other media, he's only appeared in the 2007 Ghost Rider video game, Alien War Machine, first appearing in War Machine issue 18, released in July of 1995, Rhodey was just chilling out on vacation when a woman named Sky approached him and gave him an alien armor called the Eidolon Warwear. And Rhodey was just like, okay, I mean, I guess I'll wear it, since his War Machine armor had recently been destroyed. And so, for the next dozen or so issues, Rhodey wore an alien War Machine armor. This new suit was an attempt by Marvel to distance Rhodey from Iron Man. Because as crazy as it sounds, there was a time where Iron Man wasn't very popular. And if he was unpopular, that means War Machine was even more unpopular. So by giving Rhodey a new costume with new abilities and all that, they tried to rebrand War Machine as a hero who's bonded to their suit in a way similar to Venom. This suit didn't last very long, as Rhodey would eventually sacrifice the suit during a mission, but what exactly could this alien armor do? Well, it could fly faster than any Iron Man or War Machine armor, create particle beams and concussive force blasts, it could also release several drones to fly around the armor to fight people, and it could also heal injuries. Recorder 451 First appearing in Iron Man issue 6, released in February 2013, 451 was a Regilian Recorder. These are sentient robots created to explore the universe and report their findings to their creators, the Regilians. 451 was a special recorder as it remembered everything it had ever seen, even after the memories were extracted from him. And because of this, it got tired of just observing the universe, and so it broke free from its creators. Eventually, 451 would discover Earth, which it believed would one day bring peace to the universe. So it decided that Earth needed to be protected at all costs. So it found the God Killer armor, an enormous armor created to battle the Celestials. But this armor needed repair, and so it spent decades repairing it. And that's where the Starks come in. It turns out that in the 1970s, 451 made a deal with Howard Stark, promising to save his unborn child. However, 451 would also modify the child with Kree tech to make it think differently, basically making the baby smarter and go on to create advanced weapons and technology. It also made it so the child would be the only one to be able to pilot the God Killer armor. That child, of course, was Arno Stark. Yeah, it's not Tony. But 451 thought it was. 451 attempted to force Tony into the God Killer armor by sending the God Killer armor on autopilot to destroy a planet. The only way to stop it would be to connect with it. Tony tried to connect with it, but since he wasn't Arno Stark, he failed and the planet blew up. So 451 was then like, fine, I'll just make it attack the Earth. You'll have to connect with it then. Tony then explained to 451 that he literally can't connect with it. And 451 didn't take this well, as it decided to delete itself and ordered God Killer to leave the main Marvel Universe. Punisher War Machine in The Punisher, issue 218, released in November 2017, Frank Castle was asked by Nick Fury Jr. to go on a mission to take out a warlord that was created by some ex-SHIELD agents. In order to make sure he'd be able to take out the warlord and his army, Fury gave Castle the location to the Model 8 War Machine armor. Punisher took it and used the War Machine armor to do what the Punisher does best. Kill. And after the mission was complete, he decided to keep the armor. So he went around eradicating crime in New York City. Especially Hydra. Punisher made it his mission to hunt down every Hydra agent in the city. This caught the attention of the Avengers. Because a dude flying around in a war machine armor killing criminals left and right in New York City is bound to get some attention. 
Punisher was able to evade capture from Captain Marvel, Falcon, Spider-Man, Beast, Iron Man, Hercules, etc. Though he would eventually be convinced to retire from being the War Machine by Rhodey, who had recently been brought back to life. Because if you remember, I mentioned earlier that he was killed by Thanos during Civil War II. Arsenal First appearing in Iron Man issue 114, released in June 1978, Arsenal, or Arsenal Beta, is a prototype doomsday weapon created by Howard Stark after the US government asked him to make it during the Cold War. Arsenal's processors were based on Howard Stark and the AI that was supposed to help this doomsday robot, named Mistress, was based on Maria Stark. And after their creation, the US government was like, Hey look, Howard, I know we asked you to make a doomsday weapon, but this is really extreme, we can't use this. And so, they were put into storage for decades. But not in like a US Army base or something, they were stored underneath Stark Mansion, which had recently become Avengers Mansion. And during a battle with Unicorn in Titanium Man, Arsenal was activated and fought everyone it saw. Tony was able to convince Mistress that the Avengers weren't a threat to them, and told them that Howard and Maria were both dead. So Mistress activated a bomb to kill Arsenal, and then deleted herself. But that bomb didn't destroy Arsenal. It did damage it, but it was still kicking. Until Hulk and She-Hulk found it and destroyed it. Arsenal's remains were then kept in storage for a while, until Jocasta rebuilt it to serve as a trading robot at Avengers Academy. She also got rid of its lethal weapons, because obviously. Meanwhile, Tony had Mistress in Arsenal's minds, or whatever robots got, placed into a virtual reality he created called Escape. Which, yeah, side note, Tony was able to find a fragment of Mistress, so he brought her back. There, in Escape, Arsenal would serve as a moderator who would ban people for breaking the terms of service while Mistress became the Motherboard, an AI that ran escape systems. Everything was going well until the villain, Controller, hacked into escape and messed with Arsenal and Mistress. Arsenal began banning everyone, while Mistress began wanting to protect Tony at all costs. Forcing him into the virtual world so that she could protect him, Tony would eventually be able to break free and escape escape, deleting both AIs. Except, he failed to do that. As it turns out, Arno Stark is weird, and took the AIs and placed them into robots modeled to look like Howard and Maria Stark. He then had them help him forcefully prepare the world into helping him battle the Extinction Entity, the being that he thought was going to show up, that I mentioned earlier in the Iron Man 2020 entry. And that's when Iron Man showed up and tricked Arno into living in a virtual reality, and then convinced Arsenal and Mistress to join him, in order for them to, like, convince Arno that he wasn't living in a simulation. As for Arsenal's abilities, it's got superhuman strength, radars, and threat detection systems that allow it to track all movements around it. It can also repair itself, and it being a doomsday weapon, it's got a lot of weapons, like a head-mounted flashbang, a chest-mounted cannon, knockout gas, laser eyes, darts capable of piercing through Hulk's skin, shoulder cannons, ice guns, a vacuum-like device, and several lethal chemical weapons. There was also another arsenal that Howard created, Arsenal Alpha, which was stored in a different spot underneath Avengers Mansion. It would activate one day and go on a rampage, but was taken out pretty quickly by the Avengers and the Department of Homeland Security. Arsenal has only appeared in one piece of media outside the comics. Avengers Assemble. Ready your armor. We'll be right back to Iron Man on Disney XD. Marvel's Iron Man 3 has arrived, and Subway has your ticket to Fresh. Score a chance to win a free ticket to Iron Man 3 with every better-for-you Subway Fresh Fit for Kids meal, featuring an exclusive meal bag. Iron Man 3 in theaters May 3rd. Subway, eat fresh. Blast off! Now back to Iron Man, right here on Disney XD. Tony Hawk's Underground In Tony Hawk's Underground, released in 2003, Iron Man was featured as a guest skateboarder and is unlocked after completing the game's beginner story mode. He's the third and final Marvel guest character to appear in the Tony Hawk franchise, 
with Spider-Man and Wolverine showing up in earlier entries. Also, despite hearing the skateboard's wheels, Tony's skateboard is actually a hoverboard. There's no wheels at all. The dude's floating. Novels. While nowhere near as popular as his appearances in comics, movies, and cartoons, there's been a lot of different Iron Man novels released over the years. The first being Iron Man and Call My Killer Modoc, released in May 1979, and the latest being Iron Man The Gauntlet, released in October 2016. These novels are usually original stories, though there are a few novelizations of the movies. There's also some that are adapted from the comics, like Iron Man Extremis, which is based on the 2005 story arc of the same name. Limo Man. In What If issue 34, released in May of 1982, the world was introduced to Tony Stark of Earth 8234 8. In this reality, he wasn't Iron Man, but instead, Limo Man. This issue of What If was a joke issue, filled with a bunch of one-off ideas. Don't believe me? Look, there, there's like nothing else for me to talk about this. Exo Manowar slash Iron Man in Heavy Metal. Released in 1996, Exo Manowar slash Iron Man in Heavy Metal, developed by Real Time Associates, is a video game crossover between Iron Man and the Valiant comics hero, Exo Manowar. It was released on a variety of systems, like the PlayStation 1, the Sega Saturn, the Game Boy, and even the Game Gear. The game allowed you to play in both single player and co-op. You battle through a variety of different levels, and take on a variety of different Iron Man and Man of War villains, like Titanium Man, Crimson Dynamo, Absorbing Man, Krytos, and Mistress Crescendo. They're trying to collect the fragments of the Cosmic Cube, so you gotta take them all down. This crossover didn't just include a video game, though. There was also a two-issue comic miniseries that adapted the events of the game. The game received extremely bad reviews, getting various 3 out of 10s. Critics and players alike said that the graphics, gameplay, and even the sound design were poor. It was also just extremely boring. There was also an Atari Jaguar port in development, but that port was cancelled because... It was the Atari Jaguar. The Phoenix Buster. First appearing in Avengers vs. X-Men issue 5, released in June 2012, the Phoenix Buster armor, or the Phoenix Killer armor, is exactly what it sounds like. During the Avengers vs. X-Men event, which I'll talk about in a future X-Men iceberg, the Phoenix Force was heading to Earth, and so Tony decided to put a stop to this cosmic entity once and for all by creating a giant suit of armor designed to kill it and free Hope Summers. And while he was able to save Hope Summers, he didn't kill it. He did hurt the Phoenix Force, though, but instead of dying, it just split up into five different parts that went on to possess various X-Men. As for its abilities, it's got a giant disruptor beam designed to kill the Phoenix, and it could fire giant repulsor blasts from its hands. U.S. War Machine Lasting from September 2001 to July of 2003, U.S. War Machine was a series of comics that was part of Marvel's Max line. This was a line of comics aimed exclusively at adults, and most of the series under this line were set in their own continuity, though there were exceptions. U.S. War Machine sees Rhodey leading a team of heroes under S.H.I.E.L.D. to battle various villains, like Doctor Doom, MODOK, and AIM, after being fired by Tony Stark. And he does all the usual War Machine stuff you'd expect, only they say the F word a lot. The team of War Machine armors he leads consists of a variety of different agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., like Dum Dum Dugan, Shiva Josephs, Parnell Jacobs, George Salzero, Nathan Manning, and Sabiro Sakai. Some of these characters were created for the comic, while others are based on characters from the main Marvel Universe, like Dum Dum Dugan, Shiva, and Parnell Jacobs. Also, you've probably noticed by now, but yes, the first 12 issues of the comic looked like this, while the final three issues, called US War Machine 2.0, looked like this. I don't know why they did this. No idea why they went from a comic book to Xavier Renegade Angel.
I gotta admit though, this MODOK design is so dumb, it kinda goes hard. The Animated Series, Season 3. Sadly, Iron Man the Animated Series had a very troubled production. So troubled, in fact, that the second season of the show didn't even have a producer until three months into production. This troubled production pretty much guaranteed that Iron Man the Animated Series would not get a third season. But that doesn't mean there weren't plans in place for a potential third season. In an interview with Tom Tedaranovich, a writer for season two of the show, confirmed that there were ideas being pitched for a third season, such as Julia Carpenter's Spider-Woman giving Tony an ultimatum about their relationship within the first episode of the season, which would lead into a season-long storyline about Tony Stark going on a downward spiral before coming back up. He would also be extremely guilt-ridden throughout the season over his history of being a weapons manufacturer. Alpha Team First appearing in Iron Man issue 15, released in February 2007, Alpha Team is a team of special forces that worked under S.H.I.E.L.D. They were created by Tony Stark after he became the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the aftermath of Civil War. So what were they like? Like Task Force 141? Bad Company? Lego Alpha Team or something? Nope, they're a team of soldiers who wear Iron Man light armor. They're not even remotely as powerful as an Iron Man war machine or even a rescue armor. Though this armor does allow soldiers to fly, and it provides excellent protection against gunfire and nuclear weapons. Yeah, one of the Alpha Team members gets nuked and lives. The suits also allowed them to cloak themselves, and of course, they got repulsor weapons. However, they didn't always have repulsor weapons, as originally, they used modified AUGs, at least I think they're AUGs, I could be wrong, I'm not a gun nerd, that fired non-lethal rounds, though they could swap over to lethal rounds if they wanted to. These rifles were known as the Stark Tactical Assault Repulsor. Steel Corpse First appearing in Age of X Universe Issue 1, released in March 2011, Tony Stark in this universe was Iron Man, like usual, and did your usual Iron Man stuff. Until one day, the Jeffries brothers, Lionel and Madison, they infected Tony with some kind of virus that fused Tony to his Iron Man armor. And to make matters worse, the suit began to digest him alive, slowly. Tony jokingly gave himself the new superhero name, Steel Corpse. Tony continued his superhero work for over a decade, despite being digested alive, until an emergency override took over his armor and tried to make Tony murder a bunch of mutant kids. In response, Tony told Captain America to kill him, and so he did. A pretty heroic sacrifice. Though I probably should mention here that in this universe, uh, Tony alongside the rest of the Avengers were constantly being sent on missions to murder or capture mutants. Uh, mutant terrorists sometimes, but uh, but yeah, they worked for a fascist police state that wanted to either kill, sterilize, imprison, or relocate mutants. Cool that he saved some kids, but uh, you know, just I just wish he didn't do evil stuff for like a decade prior. Tony Stark's talking sentient brain tumor. So in the Ultimate Universe, Tony Stark had a brain tumor, but this brain tumor was different from all your other brain tumors because it was sentient. Yes, this brain tumor named Anthony was a processor with his own mind and consciousness who would occasionally talk to Tony by creating hallucinations of a little boy. Yeah, comic books are weird. Although it turns out that this wasn't actually a tumor, but instead an infinity gem lodged in his brain. Anyways, Anthony could control and communicate with technology independent of Tony. For example, Tony could, and has, piloted Iron Man armor without Tony being in it. He did this once to control a giant Iron Man armor and fought against Reed Richards and a kaiju-sized Hulk. Don't worry though, this little freak is dead. Mr. Fantastic took the Infinity Gem from Tony's brain, so Anthony vanished. Cancelled Activision Iron Man Game Throughout the 2000s, there was an Iron Man video game in some form of development. Activision had the rights to not just an Iron Man video game, but an Iron Man video game that would tie in with the upcoming Iron Man film. And so, there was some early work on the game being done 
while they waited for the film to come out in 2005. It did not come out in 2005. Then they waited for 2006. It did not come out in 2006. The film was delayed until 2008, with an entirely different team working on the film, so Activision said, screw it, and dropped the license, cancelling the game. The concept drawings that you've been looking at were created by Casey Holtz, who designed some level ideas and gameplay mechanics. Go check out his blog about this cancelled game. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Ultron Buster First appearing in Tony Stark Iron Man issue 16, released in September 2019, Tony Stark created this armor to take out Ultron. Obviously. Iron Man suited up in the armor once Ultron kidnapped Janet Van Dyne and Jocasta. He managed to save them, but a device created by Ultron to fuse people to stuff went off, and Tony became fused to the suit. Despite this extremely painful process, and the fact that he'd received a few fatal injuries, Tony fought through the pain and fought Ultron. After the incident with Ultron, Tony used the Model 58 armor I mentioned earlier to remove himself from the suit. And since then, the Ultron Buster hasn't appeared, probably because it's barely being held together at this point. As for the suit's abilities, it's got all your standard Iron Man stuff, like flight, repulsor weapons, missiles, etc. It can also create energy shields, and since it's a Buster armor, it's stronger than your average Iron Man armor. The Iron Maniac First appearing in Marvel Team-Up Issue 2, released in November 2004, Tony Stark from Earth-5012 was not exactly what I would call a good person. He was once a good person, but after the Titanus War, Tony went a little cuckoo. This was a war in which the villain Titanus lured the Avengers to the Trillian homeworld, where they'd be enslaved for five years. There, Wasp and Captain America would be killed. And while this was all happening, the Trillians were attacking Earth. After being rescued, and the Trillians left Earth alone, Tony began to believe that Mr. Fantastic was becoming evil. And so, he tried to kill him. In this deranged state, Tony killed Black Widow, Wolverine, and the Human Torch. He would eventually take up the mantle of Doctor Doom and take over the nation of Latveria, where he would plan on conquering the world to save it from Mr. Fantastic. But Reed had different plans and sent Tony to another reality, the main Marvel Universe. There, he would eventually go by the name Iron Maniac and attempt to travel back to his reality, but he was stopped by Captain America, Black Widow, Spider-Man, and X-23, so now he was trapped in this universe. He ended up being captured, then he escaped, fought some more Avengers, and then was captured again. And uh, that's kind of it. He's still in custody, and hasn't been seen since Marvel Team-Up Issue 24, released in September 2006. As for Iron Maniac's powers, he's got the ability to fly, create force fields, magnetic fields, use repulsor weaponry, unibeams, he's got super strength, and he also wore a suit that could turn into anything he wanted, like weapons, or tentacle-like appendages to grab people. He's also got a weapon that can temporarily take powers away from people, so that's pretty useful. The Model 72 First appearing in Thor issue 25, released in May 2022, the Model 72 armor was created by Tony Stark by using parts of a dead Celestial. You see, this armor was a Hulkbuster armor, but unlike any that came before. It was practically the size of a Celestial, and had an insane amount of power and weapons. It had missile batteries, guns and repulsor weapons all across the armor, and it allowed Tony to travel through space in practically no time at all. Sounds like a pretty OP armor. Although, the only time he actually ever used this armor, it didn't work out that well. Tony was able to defeat Hulk at first, but Hulk, who at this point in time wasn't controlled by Bruce Banner, created an extremely large gamma explosion, which not only messed up the armor, but also turned Thor, who was in the area, into a gamma-radiated mutant just like Hulk, who then went on to annihilate the Model 72. I should probably mention this now, though. While I said earlier that this was a Hulkbuster, 
It wasn't originally created to be a Hulkbuster armor. Originally, this armor was created to teleport the people of Earth into a pocket dimension whenever there was a large-scale conflict on Earth, like an alien invasion or something. The Mauler First appearing in Iron Man issue 156, released in December of 1981, Brendan Doyle was a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, who was buddies with Rhodey. The two worked together as mercenaries for a while, until Rhodey went straight and joined Stark International. Brendan didn't want to do that, though, and continued being a mercenary. This would lead to him being hired by a dude named Edwin Cord. He had Brendan steal the Mauler suit, the Mobile Armored Utility Laser Emitter Revised Suit. Upon stealing it, Brendan was like, I'm gonna keep this, and thus became the villain Mauler. He came into contact with Iron Man after he attacked Stark International, in order to get rid of any evidence that Edwin Cord had anything to do with the creation of the Mauler suit. But Iron Man showed up, so Brendan fled. So, Plan B. Reuniting with his old friend Rhodey, Brendan held Rhodey hostage while trying to break into Stark International. This plan didn't work out very well either, so he bailed again. He continued to occasionally give Iron Man some trouble over the next few decades, working for and with a variety of different characters, like Kingpin, Hammerhead, Ezekiel Stain, Chemistro, and the Mandarin. Although, despite doing all that, he didn't actually really do all that much, story-wise. But then, his story took a darker turn, as one day, he found out that his son, Danny, was killed in a car crash. This messed him up pretty badly. So badly, that when he saw another kid named Bobby that looked vaguely like Danny, he kidnapped the kid in order to raise him as his own. He would eventually snap out of it a little bit later, but... Still, he kidnapped a kid. As for Mauler's abilities, his suit gives him enhanced strength, stamina, and can even allow him to fly. Its main weapon, and why it was so dangerous, is the Blaze Cannon, an extremely powerful laser cannon. He's also got a gauntlet that lets out electrical punches, like a Galva Knuckle. Brendan is also not the only Mauler. There's been three others. There's Aaron Soames, who first appeared in Daredevil issue 167, released in August of 1980. And he was the first Mauler. Aaron was a man in his 60s who got mad when Edwin Cord's company destroyed his legal records, which made it so that Aaron couldn't get his 35-year pension. So he stole the Mauler armor and went out to get revenge. But instead of killing Edwin Cord, he simply destroyed all of his legal documents. And then Cord's security shot and killed Aaron. Rest in peace. Then there's Turk Barrett, who first appeared in Daredevil issue 69, released in October of 1970. Although he wouldn't actually become Mauler until Daredevil issue 176, released in July of 1981. And he wasn't Mauler for very long. While working under Kingpin, he stole the Mauler armor and attempted to kill Daredevil. He failed, and then he never wore the armor again. And finally, there's an unnamed Mauler who's worked for the Hobgoblin and Green Goblin. He first appeared in Superior Spider-Man issue 26, released in January 2014, and hasn't done anything. As for his appearances in media outside comics, Brendan Doyle's version of the Mauler has only appeared in the PSP and Wii ports of Iron Man 2 the video game. Iron Giant Man, first appearing in Mutant X issue 30, Released in February 2001, this is an Iron Man from another universe where mutants aren't exactly treated very well. In fact, S.H.I.E.L.D. in this universe was hunting them down. As for Tony, he was part of the Avengers and mainly had your standard Iron Man abilities, except for the fact that he could grow to the size of a kaiju whenever he wanted to. The Avengers in this universe weren't your standard superheroes anymore, Instead, they were enforcers of international policy. So in Captain America, who's a mutant in this universe, well, not Steve Rogers, he's dead in this universe, this is a different guy, and several other mutants attempted to cross the border to Canada, they were called in to stop them from causing a potential international incident. They showed up, and they were all killed. And uh, that's really the only thing I can say about this Iron Man. I just wanted to include him in the video because his name is Iron Giant Man. Ice Age Man. 
In Avengers issue 31, released in February 2020, Tony Stark gets trapped in the year 1 million BC. Tony needed to create a new suit of armor in order to survive the literal Ice Age he was transported to. So, using pieces of technology from his now destroyed modern day Iron Man armor, and some vibranium batteries, Tony was able to create the Ice Age Man armor. This makeshift armor wasn't all that great in combat. It did have the ability to fire repulsor blasts, but any time that they were fired, the armor would melt because of how hot the repulsor blasts were. He also had a wrist cannon that fired icicles. Despite the suit being pretty poor in combat, thanks to the suit, Tony was able to survive an encounter with Mephisto. In fact, the armor's repulsor blast is how Tony was able to return to the present day, as he used the repulsor blast to damage the Time Stone. Cancerverse First appearing in Realm of Kings, released in November 2009, Iron Man of Earth 10,011 was from the Cancerverse. This is a reality where death had been conquered, so everyone can live forever. The only problem is that this life is hell, as now all life in this universe was being fueled by the Ancient Ones, basically Eldritch Gods. And because they fueled everything, everyone and everything became corrupted, resulting in the universe being one giant living corpse. Tony, in this universe, worked with the Revengers, a team consisting of various former Avengers working under Marvel. They traveled around the universe, making sure everything was nice and corrupted. So when Nova from the main Marvel Universe arrived in their universe, they weren't too happy, and eventually this Iron Man and the Revengers attempted to corrupt the main Marvel Universe as well. Luckily, they failed, and they were all killed when Thanos brought his girlfriend Death over to the Cancerverse, which reintroduced the concept of death to this universe. Though Iron Man and the Revengers would later be resurrected and possessed by the Ancient Ones, but since then, he hasn't really done anything. As for his powers, he's got pretty much the same power set as your standard Iron Man. Godbuster First appearing in Tony Stark Iron Man issue 10, released in April 2019, the Godbuster armor is one of, if not the, most powerful Iron Man armor in the main Marvel Universe. I mentioned earlier that Mistress had trapped Tony in the Escape, the virtual reality created by Tony Stark. Well, while in Escape, Tony's mind was free of the restraints of the human brain, so his imagination went wild and created this suit of armor, the Godbuster armor. Not only did he use the armor in virtual reality, but when he returned to the real world, he used several bleeding edge printers to create the armor in real life. Upon its creation, he used the armor to take out the villain controller, and then he had the Godbuster armor self-destruct, because he deemed it to be far too dangerous to exist. While we never got to see the armor at its full potential, it's been called Tony's masterpiece and described as the ultimate weapon. And it must be pretty powerful for Tony to flat out destroy it due to its potential danger to the universe. Tony ends the Age of Heroes. In What If issue 64, released in June 1994, Tony Stark decides to go public. Not like reveal that he's Iron Man, although he does do that. He patents the Iron Man armor, and then he starts selling the armor around the world. This results in the deaths of a lot of heroes. For example, the entire Fantastic Four are killed with Iron Man tech purchased by Doctor Doom. An Iron Man arms race begins, and Magneto is not very happy. He tells the United Nations to stop using Iron Man tech. If they don't, he'll destroy them. The United Nations then respond with creating the Sentinels. These Sentinels would go out and kill most of the X-Men, and the final few X-Men that were alive were then killed by Magneto and his forces. So it's up to a team consisting of War Machine, Spider-Man, Daredevil, Elektra, Thor, Hank Pym, Wasp, and Iron Man to stop Magneto. Yep, Tony's back in the fight. 
After going public and seeing all the damage he caused, Tony became recluse for a while, though he's eventually broken out of the slump once he finds out that, that Magneto is causing mayhem everywhere, since everyone's using Iron Man tech, and Magneto can easily just rip that apart. So Tony creates a giant Iron Man armor made out of polymer, and flies off to face him. It also looks really ugly, it's terrible. War Machine also has a very weird armor. Tony also has a plan. He's going to absorb all of Magneto's magnetic energy to cause his armor to explode, which will then send the energy to some satellites that'll then spread the energy across the globe to destroy all Iron Man armor and Stark tech. However, this would force the world into a new Dark Age, so the Avengers calm Tony down, and they decide to threaten the world's governments to stop production of the Sentinels, or they'll send the world back into the Dark Age. And so, the Age of Heroes is over, as a good chunk of Avengers, the entire Fantastic Four, and every single X-Men is dead. But hey, Tony and the rest of the surviving heroes made a new Avengers team, so that's cool, I guess. Argonaut Armors First appearing in Iron Man issue 7, released in April 2006, the Argonaut Armors are a series of five armors created by Iron Man that could operate independent of Tony. At one point, the son of Ho Yinsen was taking control over Iron Man and having him assassinate various criminal leaders across the globe. Tony didn't really care for being mind-controlled, so he eventually found him, but before he could get much information out of him, a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent killed the son of Ho Yinsen, which activates the Argonaut armors. Turns out, while under Ho Yinsen's son's control, Tony placed a program in the armors that made them activate and go on a rampage if Ho Yinsen's son died. The submarine armor goes off and tries to kill Namor, but it gets destroyed. The stealth armor attempted to kill Iron Man, but failed. The battle armor attempted to destroy some nuclear reactors in Russia, but gets destroyed. The subterranean armor attempted to flood the Persian Gulf with oil, but gets destroyed. And finally, the Hulkbuster armor attacked Times Square and defeated the combined efforts of Captain America, Spider-Man, Carol Danvers, Luke Cage, Wolverine, and She-Hulk. It's only stopped when Tony commits Avengers Endgame yourself to sever his connection with the armor, since this Hulkbuster suit was controlled by Tony's subconscious. So he sends 10,000 volts to his heart, which kills him. But don't worry, he's revived about a half hour later, so the day is saved. Iron Man Noir First appearing in Iron Man Noir issue 1, released in April 2010, everyone knows about Spider-Man Noir, but less people know that he's not the only hero of Earth 9214. Tony Stark of this reality was also a superhero, who fought against the Axis powers. In this reality, Tony was an adventurer. Stories about his adventures would be told in magazines, which made him pretty famous. On one of these adventures, he, Rhodey, his friend Virgil, and his girlfriend, Gialetta Nefaria, discovered the Jade Mask, which was supposed to cure any disease. But it didn't work, as when Tony put it on, it did nothing to help his heart condition. But then Nefaria was like, by the way, guys, I hope this doesn't cause any issue, but, uh, yeah, I'm actually working with the Axis powers. Sorry. And Baron Zemo and Baron Strucker rolled in and killed Virgil. Tony and Rhodey fled, but not before starting a fire which severely burned Nefaria's face, so she became Madame Mask. Still looking for a cure for his heart condition, Tony set off to find Atlantis with the help of the pirate captain, Namor. He was able to find it, but before he could do anything, Zemo and Strucker showed up and captured Tony's friend Pepper, who they hired to replace Virgil. After escaping again, Tony and Rhodey suit up in armors created by their buddy Jarvis, and storm Zemo's castle to rescue Pepper. There they battle a ton of Axis soldiers, Zemo, Strucker, and even this universe's version of Arsenal. It's also revealed that Zemo was Tony Stark's father, who had been brainwashed by Strucker. Tony's like, wow, that's cool, I guess, but I'm still gonna kill you. So they're killed, and Pepper and the day are saved. 
Tony then decides to abandon adventuring across the globe, and instead becomes the superhero Iron Man. As for Iron Man Noir's powers, his suit gives him protection against gunfire. It also comes with missiles and multiple M2 Brownings built into the suit. It also has enhanced strength and can transform into a weird motorcycle. Legacy of Doom Iron Man Legacy of Doom is a four-issue miniseries written by David Michelini and Bob Layden that ran from April 2008 to July of the same year. In this story, Tony discovers some data on an old Iron Man armor that relates to a mission he doesn't remember going on. The story then flashes back to that mission. Turns out that Doctor Doom had asked for Tony Stark's help in dealing with some Latverian rebels. He only helps Doctor Doom in getting rid of these rebels because Doctor Doom was going to kill them. So Tony was like, okay, I'll just like make him leave, don't, don't kill them. So Iron Man stopped their rebellion. And then Doctor Doom was like, hey Tony, I got a time cube, wanna come with me? And using that time cube, they arrive in hell. The two then fight off a bunch of demons who all look like weird green blob monsters for some reason, until they find Mephisto. And it's revealed that Doctor Doom had made a deal with Mephisto to bring Tony Stark to hell, in exchange for a piece of the sword Excalibur. Doom then bails, and Iron Man's now trapped in hell. And there, he fights a demon who's taken the form of his father, Howard Stark. Iron Man is eventually able to defeat this demon and escape Hell. But upon returning to Earth, he discovers that Doctor Doom has now fused with the sword Excalibur. The two fight for a bit until Merlin shows up and tells Tony that, that he's the champion of King Arthur, so he needs to find Excalibur's scabbard. He's able to find it at Stonehenge, and Tony's suit transforms into a magic Iron Man armor. And then, a Lovecraftian eyeball monster shows up, and it turns out that Doctor Doom had only gotten Excalibur to kill this thing. It turns out that the only way to kill this thing is to stab Iron Man in the chest, since he fused with the scabbard. Once they do this, this kills the monster, and Tony and Doctor Doom are returned to normal, and Merlin wipes their minds clean. It's a wild read. Ready your armor. We'll be right back to Iron Man on Disney XD. Stark Expo, where the future is on display. That includes the BK of tomorrow, the results of Stark's merger with Burger King, and the new Buck Double. More beef than the Mick Double for just a buck. He's a prototype. The new Buck Double. It's the next big thing. Only at Burger King. Blast off. Now back to Iron Man. Right here on Disney XD. The original Iron Man 1 and 2. In 2006, the Marvel Studios MCU Iron Man film was finally in development after years of development hell. However, the original version of the film was going to be pretty different. For example, the main villain wasn't going to be Ironmonger. Jeff Bridges would play Obadiah Stane in that film, however, he would survive the film and return in a sequel where he'd become Ironmonger. It turns out that the Mandarin was going to be this film's villain, and the plot of the film would have had Mandarin's forces tunneling under Stark Industries to steal some tech. This version of the film wouldn't end up happening because Mark Miller convinced Jon Favreau that the Mandarin wasn't the best villain for an origin film because of his fantastical tone. Upon removing the Mandarin, the plan was then to have Ironmonger survive the film. After the final fight, it would be revealed that Obadiah Stane was somehow able to escape the Ironmonger suit which would lead to him returning in a sequel. As for Iron Man 2, there was originally going to be three villains in this film, Justin Hammer, Whiplash, and Ghost. Ghost never ended up happening, though she did show up later in the MCU in Ant-Man and the Wasp and Thunderbolts. Finally, the original plan for Iron Man 2 was to have Ivan Venko somehow escape the Whiplash armor 
before it explodes, allowing him to return in a future film. The Killing Machine In the 1980s, the late comic legend Dwayne McDuffie pitched an idea to Marvel Comics about a miniseries called The Killing Machine. This story would have been about the Punisher stealing an Iron Man armor, painting it black, and then going around killing criminals left and right. Iron Man wouldn't really like this, and so he would try to stop him. There would also be a sequel about Rhodey donning the black painted Iron Man armor, which would lead into its own series starring Rhodey. Sadly, this storyline never happened, but McDuffie has said before that he likes to think that this pitch influenced the creation of the War Machine armor, and decades later, Punisher would end up wearing the War Machine armor. Melter First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 47, released in August of 1963, Bruno Horgan was an industrialist who went bankrupt after the US government found out that he was using some very low quality materials to build his designs and weapons. Because of this, all of his contracts were then given to Tony Stark. This obviously made Bruno very angry, and so he did what anyone would have done. He created a melting ray, strapped it to his chest, and went to go destroy some Stark industry factories. Iron Man would then show up and defeat Bruno, who was now going by the name The Melter. Melter's melting ray was specialized in melting iron, so you would think that Iron Man would be screwed, but Tony actually made a new set of armor that was made of aluminum, so he was fine. The Melter would go on to become a recurring villain for Iron Man, but would also find himself fighting other heroes, like the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, as he was now part of the group The Masters of Evil. Eventually, Bruno would change up his costume and weapons, because the chest-mounted melting gun wasn't super effective. So he created a melting gun. And by create, I mean he kidnapped Tony Stark and forced him to design a new melting gun for him. He used it against Iron Man for a bit until he was like, alright, I'm just gonna put this thing on my belt. And so he rolled with a belt-mounted melting gray for a while. Over his criminal career, he worked with a variety of villains, like Justin Hammer, Doctor Doom, Whiplash, Blizzard, Manbull, and even Ultron. His career ended when the assassin Scourge, not that Scourge, rolled in and killed him. And since then, he stayed dead. Bruno's original melting ray was strapped to his chest and could only melt steel and iron. The second version of the melting ray could melt any form of metal, along with stone, wood, and human flesh. And finally, his third version of the Melting Ray, the belt-mounted one, pretty much did the same thing as the second version. But Bruno wasn't the only Melter. An unnamed Melter appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 589, released in March 2009. He appeared in the background and did nothing and hasn't appeared since. Then there's Christopher Colchis, who first appeared in Dark Reign Young Avengers Issue 1, released in May 2009. Unlike Bruno, Christopher actually has melting powers, and accidentally killed his parents when he was just a kid. He would work with a Mandarin in the Masters of Evil for some time, and face off against Iron Man for a bit. But since he's a mutant, he's mostly spent his time in the X-Men side of the Marvel Universe. And finally, there's another unnamed Melter, who first appeared in Superior Spider-Man issue 26, released in January 2014. He worked under Hobgoblin and Green Goblin. He's done some crimes and whatnot, but the most notable thing about him is that one day, Tony Stark was having a pretty bad day, and Melter decided on that day that he was going to melt Tony Stark's car. So he did. Tony then knocked him out, flew him in the air, and then dropped him. He then decided at the last second to not kill Melter, and caught him before he could hit the ground. As for Melter's appearances in other media, Bruno's incarnation of the Melter has appeared in Ultimate Spider-Man, The Superhero Squad Show, MODOK, LEGO Marvel's Avengers, Iron Man the Video Game, and the Marvel Superheroes. There's also been a kinda adaptation of the character in Armored Adventures. War Machine is a sentient tank. 
first appearing in Captain Britain and the Mighty Defenders issue 1, released in July 2015, the War Machine was a giant tank controlled by a sentient AI that attempted to invade Yinsen City, in reality Earth 25315. It failed to do so and was taken out by She-Hulk and the Defenders. This sentient tank was actually created to be a parody of the robots featured in the Judge Dredd franchise and the War Machine from Doctor Who, and the robotic tank from the restaurant at the end of the universe. So now you're probably wondering, why is this on the iceberg? It's not really related to War Machine. It's just called War Machine. Well, it's because I think that this is this universe's War Machine. As Tony existed in this universe, but died, so Ho Yinsen became Iron Man, although he's actually called Rescue, while his daughter, Antonia Yinsen, is Kid Rescue. So with all these Iron Man characters existing, I'm gonna say that this is meant to be this universe's war machine. Anyways, as for its abilities, it's a giant sentient tank, so it's got a ton of cannons, missiles, and machine guns. It's also got a power drill and a chainsaw, so that's pretty crazy. R2-D2 Iron Man. Only appearing in Thor issue 600, released in February 2009, well, I mean, he does appear in the issue, but only in a joke story. Welcome back, Thor. In this story, Thor returns to life after being dead for a while, and everyone's mad at him for killing Goliath. Even though in reality, it wasn't him. It was his robot clone, Ragnarok. Thor then destroys Ragnarok, and in order to teach his friends a lesson about using your dead friend's DNA to create a cyborg clone of said friend, and then have that clone kill one of your friends, Thor creates some clones of Iron Man, Hank Pym, and Mr. Fantastic, with the Iron Man clone being based on R2-D2. And, uh, that's it. That's R2-D2 Iron Man. That's, that's all there is. Minotaur. Only appearing in Iron Man issue 24, released in April of 1970, Miklas Vrolak was a poor child who was suffering from an incurable disease. His father desperately wanted to save his son's life. So desperate that he gave his son some medicine created from some ancient medical charts he found in the ruins of a labyrinth. This turned him into a minotaur, which wasn't great. But he was cured of the disease, so... I mean, I guess that's good. So then his father was like, Son, I'm so happy you're cured. After your mother died, I, I don't know what I would have done if you died too. Now, um, could you go clap some cheeks? So his father attempted to turn Madame Mask into a Minotaur so that his son could bang her. Iron Man would then show up to save her, and a fight would break out. This fight would result in the cave they were in to collapse, killing the Minotaur and his weird dad. As for the Minotaur's powers, he's, uh, he's got super strength and durability, and that, that's kind of it. Iron Man, look back in armor. This was a cancelled miniseries that would have been released in the late 1990s. It was supposed to be written by Kurt Buschek and tell the story of what happened to Teen Tony after the events of Onslaught and Heroes Reborn. The miniseries never ended up happening, and instead, Teen Tony's fate would be revealed in the 2001 Avengers Annual. Satellite Armor Tony Stark can be pretty paranoid sometimes. And I mean, in a universe where there's scrolls and a planet-sized monster that eats planets, that's pretty fair. But in his paranoia, he created a secret satellite station that floated around Earth's orbit in case Earth came under attack by someone or something that the Avengers and other heroes of Earth couldn't fight off. This satellite was built without using any Stark Tech designs known to the public out of fear that somebody would hack into the station and take control of it, or destroy it. So what exactly was this satellite? Well, it was actually a giant, transforming Iron Man armor with the firepower to destroy entire fleets of enemy ships. But who could pilot this thing? Well, Tony only trusted one man in the universe to pilot the satellite armor, Daredevil. Okay, no, it's actually Rhodey, obviously, but it'd be funny if it was Daredevil. So yeah, that's why this thing looks like a giant war machine armor. Because it, well, kind of was. And Rhodey used the armor's enormous cannons and repulsor blasts to annihilate a scroll fleet. 
that attempted to invade Earth. Bakugan vs. Marvel In 2011, Marvel teamed up with Bakugan to release special Marvel-themed Bakugan figures, with the idea being that the Marvel heroes are battling against the Bakugan monsters. There were many different Marvel heroes represented in this line, like Captain America, Wolverine, Spider-Man, Red, Sk Red Skull. The guy who made a woman murder her husband to save her baby, only to then throw the baby out the window. That's the guy they went with? Okay. But Iron Man had the most figures made of him. Four, to be exact. The Iron Inquisitor. First appearing in Avengers issue 31, released in February 2020, Howard Stark of Earth-4111 made a deal with Mephisto to make himself immortal. He did this because he wanted to live in the Age of Heroes, and he knew that he would pass away before he could partake in it. So he made that deal, and in order to be immortal, he had to murder his son Tony Stark. But because this is Mephisto, no deal is ever that simple, and Howard was made a slave to the Council of Red, which is like the Council of Kangs, but it's for Mephisto. So it's like a team of multiversal Mephistos and they turned him into the Iron Inquisitor, the Chief of Security for the Council. He wore a suit of armor that Howard created that's basically a demon Iron Man armor. He's also got some pretty interesting weapons, like homing missiles that can track people through the time stream, so there's really nowhere you could run once he's got you locked on. The Anti-Transformer Armor Okay, so I briefly said earlier that I wasn't going to talk about the Avengers Transformers crossover, because I already talked about it in the first Transformers Iceberg, but I gotta mention the Anti-Transformer armor. First appearing in New Avengers Transformers Issue 2, released in August of 2007, this was a large Iron Man armor created by Tony Stark exclusively to kill Transformers. However, it was never actually completed, as it never left the testing stage. But Tony didn't care, and used it against the Decepticons. He lost, and the armor was destroyed. But hey, at the very end of the story, Tony Stark began work on a new version of the Anti-Transformer armor, one that would be bigger and better than the last. Then he died off-panel. Anthony the Vampire First appearing in Ultimate Avengers issue 13, released in August of 2010, Anthony was a vampire hunter who lived in the Ultimate Marvel Universe. He lived his life taking on vampires and doing all your classic vampire hunter stuff, until one day he was bitten by one of them and became a vampire. And then he was suddenly like, Wow, okay, well hold on, hold on guys, vampires are actually cool now, I... Let, let's go eat people, <laughs> yeah, let, let's go rule the world. So we gathered a bunch of vampires together to plan a global operation with the goal of taking over the world and ruling all of humanity. So where does Iron Man come into this? Well, he doesn't, but his armor does. Because vampires don't really care for sunlight, they couldn't really do epic vampire stuff during the day. So Anthony stole the Mark I Iron Man armor so he could go around to do stuff during the daytime like kidnapping heroes to turn them into vampires. One of his first victims was Bruce Banner's clone, who was created by Tony Stark. Anthony turned him into a vampire, but then Bruce's clone turned into a vampire hulk and immediately killed him. I'd say rest in peace, but Anthony was kind of a loser. Like, okay, sure, dude, you trained Daredevil and Blade, that's cool, but you instantly turned on humanity the second you became a vampire and you stole the weakest Iron Man armor? Dude, you're a dork. General Ross becomes Cyborg War Machine. Only appearing in Secret Wars Battle World Issue 2, released in June 2015, everyone knows that General Thunderbolt Ross turns into Red Hulk. But not everyone knows about the General Ross who transformed into something very, very different. Ross of Earth 71612 was turned into a cyborg modeled off of a War Machine armor, and so he took up the name War Machine. He only did this after his daughter Betty Ross died, and he believed that she had been killed by Hulk, or at least her death had something to do with Hulk. So in order to get revenge, he turned himself into a pickle, I, I mean a cyborg, War Machine, that looks like that one Terminator from Terminator Salvation. Later, it would be revealed that Taskmaster had actually killed Betty Ross. Except not really, 
You see, around this time, Ross got captured and became a gladiator in Arcade's Coliseum. A Coliseum, but like, I don't know, let's just call it Coliseum. And he wanted to spice up the action, so he told Ross about the Taskmaster thing. So basically, he lied to make the fight between the two more interesting. As for War Machine Ross's abilities, he's got various War Machine weapons, like Repulsor Blasts, a Harpoon Launcher, and an Incinerary Ray. The Fing Fang Foom Buster. First appearing in Tony Stark Iron Man Issue 1, released in June 2018, the Model 3 FB, aka the Fing Fang Foom Buster, was created by Iron Man to, you guessed it, take out Fing Fang Foom. But just like pretty much every single Buster suit Tony's ever made, it failed, and while fighting Fing Fang Foom, it was critically damaged, forcing Tony to bail. As for the suit's abilities, it's huge, being 20 stories tall. It's also got a bunch of cannons and kaiju-level strength. It's also got electric punches, and parts of it can transform and fly around as little jets to attack Fing Fang Foom. The actor... First appearing in Tales of Suspense, issue 42, released in March 1963, Spider-Man has the chameleon, while Iron Man has the actor. His real name is unknown, as is his background. The only thing we know for sure is that he was a spy from the Soviet Union. In his first outing, he traveled to the United States and pretended to be a famous actor, then a senator, and then Tony Stark himself. He did all this to locate design plans for a disintegrator weapon being created at Stark Industries. So he infiltrates the facility, and what does he find? Well, he finds out that Tony Stark is Iron Man. He fled the facility he snuck into, but left behind some of his goons to take out Tony Stark when he arrived. But when Tony Stark showed up, he defeated the goons, suited up, and followed him. Actor then returned to the Red Barbarian, the villain who hired him in the first place. Except, it wasn't actually the actor. You see, Tony had actually beaten him up and switched places with him. He then bailed, and when the real actor showed up, the Red Barbarian got pretty mad and refused to believe that he was the real actor. So he ordered his execution. Except not really, because decades later, the actor returned, working under Red Barbarian again, and pretended to be Rhodey. Which means that he... Oh, he had to do blackface. He, the actor did blackface. Whoa! Is that blackface, dude? No, no. Anyways, as for actor's abilities, he could somehow change his own facial structure so he could impersonate anyone he wanted to. He could also switch between personas pretty quickly, switching out of costumes, makeup, and facial reconstruction surgery in just minutes. It's honestly wild that they brought this dude back. He was in one issue in 1963, and returned in 2009 for three more appearances, only for his story to end with Tony Stark smashing his skull in. Wild stuff. Problematic stuff, actually. Iron Man has an eating problem. In What If, issue 34, released in May 1982, the joke issue I mentioned earlier with Limo Man, there was another joke, What If, that answered the question to... What if Iron Man had an eating problem instead of a drinking problem? The answer? He's fat. That, that's just, that's, that's it. He, he eats an entire cow and a bunch of McDonald's, and that's kind of it. It's just a fat joke. Iron Hulk. First appearing in Contest of Champions issue 6, released in March 2016, this Tony Stark comes from a universe where he created the Gamma Bomb, which in turn accidentally transformed him into the Hulk. But he didn't let this new Hulk body ruin his chances of being a superhero. He built an Iron Man armor designed for this new Hulkish body and went on to become the hero, Iron Hulk. He was then abducted by the Elders of the Universe and killed in Battle Realm by Maestro, who took his Iron Hulk armor and began wearing it. Yeah, there's not really a lot to this guy. He's literally only in two panels. But luckily, there's another Iron Hulk. In Avengers issue 684, released in March 2018, Robert Maverick's Red Hulk took up the mantle of Iron Hulk to battle Hulk. The armor that he wore wasn't designed for him, and was actually one of Tony Ho's Heavy Combat Iron Patriot armors. He didn't really do too well in the fight against Hulk, and lost. And I guess there's technically an Iron Hulk in the MCU, because Bruce Banner wears the Hulkbuster armor, 
in Infinity War and Endgame? Remember the marketing for Endgame and how they really tried to convince people that Bruce Banner was going to be fighting in the Hulkbuster for the entirety of the film? Emperor Stark First appearing in Exiles issue 23, released in March 2003, Tony Stark of Earth 42777 was a pretty wacky guy. In fact, I'd argue that he was kind of a jerk, as he had everyone who opposed him killed. He also manipulated the entire world into electing him Emperor of the Planet for Life, which uh, does not sound like the best idea, but hey, I mean, he was the hero of the Mutant War, a war in which all of humanity and all of mutant kind were fighting each other, though he did help start the war and was secretly working with Magneto, but uh, oh well. He I mean, he had a Nobel Peace Prize for developing countermeasures for crop destruction. That's pretty cool. Doesn't really make up for the murder and fascism, but I mean, it's a start. Oh wait, no, he's the one that created the bugs that destroyed the crops. Uh, n never mind. He also created technology that controlled all of the weather and seismic activity. So he just created hurricanes and earthquakes whenever. He also had an entire fleet of Iron Man soldiers ready to kill at a moment's notice. He may sound like a pretty popular guy, but surprisingly, not everyone liked Emperor Stark. In fact, most people hated him, including Doctor Doom, who attempted to take him out, only to be killed. He would eventually meet his end when the Inhumans took him out. And by took him out, I mean the Inhumans took themselves out, which caused Sue Storm, who was married to Black Bolt, to kill Emperor Stark. It's just a really sad, messed up world. The Iron Destroyer. During the Fear Itself storyline, Tony Stark was given access to the, the Dwarven Forges of Nidavir by Odin in order to create weapons made of Uru to take out the Serpent and his forces. And using these forges, he merged his Bleeding Edge armor with Uru metal to create the Iron Destroyer armor, an Iron Man armor designed after the Destroyer weapon. He used this variation of the suit for a little bit until the battle was won. After that, he got rid of all the Uru in his suit and gave it back to the dwarves. As for this armor's abilities, the armor is enhanced by Odin's magic, and because it has Uru in it, an ancient metal that can store magic, and is extremely durable, that makes the Iron Destroyer armor extremely durable. It's also based on the Bleeding Edge armor, which can fire repulsor blasts, unibeams, pulse bolts, tasers, and even has an energy blade, along with massive guns that come out of its arms. This armor also made an appearance in Square Enix's Avengers game, War Machine Dwarves. First appearing in War of the Realms issue 5, released in June 2019, there was an event going on called the War of the Realms. Basically, Malekith and some other Thor villains invade various realms, including Earth. And during this war on Earth, the Frost Giants took over Manhattan. So while Thor and his friends go after Malekith, the Avengers and Earth's other heroes gotta reclaim Manhattan from the Frost Giants. And during this battle, Iron Man had several War Machine armors created for the Dwarves of Nidavir to aid them in battle. And uh, that's kind of it. Iron Man once commanded a team of War Machine Dwarves. Sapien Deathmatch Armor. First appearing in Iron Man House of M, Issue 1, released in July 2005, this armor was created by Tony Stark as a way to star in the sports show Sapien Deathmatch, where people in mechs face off against each other. So it's like Mecha Gladiator stuff, it's pretty cool. Now you're probably wondering, how come this Mecha Gladiator stuff isn't talked about in the main Marvel Universe? How come we haven't seen it again? Well, it's because this armor only exists in the House of M universe a reality created by the Scarlet Witch in which all of her friends and loved ones get everything they've ever wanted. As for the armor's abilities, it gives Tony superhuman strength, the ability to fly, and has an insane amount of weapons, like a flamethrower, unibeam, repulsor blasts, missile launchers, pulse beams, and laser guns. Wong Chu To end the Iron Man iceberg, let's talk about Iron Man's first villain, Kinda. The Robot Caveman was his first villain as Iron Man. This is like Tony Stark's first villain, I guess. Wong Chu was a communist commander from the fictional country Sing Kong, although he was originally from Vietnam and part of the NVA, but that got retconned, and he's the one who had Tony Stark captured. 
Yup, he's the reason Tony Stark became Iron Man. So I won't go into detail about his time holding Tony prisoner, because everyone knows that story already. And at the end of the story, Wong Chu would die. Except not really. Yes, at Iron Man issue 32, released in July 2000, Wong Chu was revealed to have survived his encounter with Tony Stark all those years ago. And in that time, he's risen up and become one of the most powerful drug lords in the entire world. He led a regime that would literally slaughter thousands at a time if people refused to serve him. Iron Man would eventually track him down and wouldn't kill him. Instead, a dude with a machete kills him. It's also revealed that Wong Chu had Ho Yinsen's still living brain in a jar. It was sold to him by an interdimensional merchant because... I don't know, man. You figured it out by now. Comics are weird. As for Wong Chu's abilities, he's a pretty good wrestler and knows some martial arts. He also wears Iron Man armor now, so he has the basic Iron Man abilities like repulsor blasts and flying. As for his appearances in other media, Wong Chu has appeared in the Invincible Iron Man animated film and served as inspiration for Rigahella in Marvel anime Iron Man and Raza in the MCU. Alright, so I'm going to keep this outro short. I hope you guys enjoyed. That was the Iron Man Iceberg. I don't know how I was able to get a three hour long video out in just over a month, like a month and uh, some change. But here we are. I did it. Yay for me. <laughs> About two nights ago, I edited from uh, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., so that's like nine hours roughly, uh, straight through the night to do uh do the iceberg and yeah i'm kind of rambling because I, I i i'm exhausted I, I i have not slept at all so yeah that's it i hope you guys enjoyed uh what's your favorite iron man armor you know what, what your favorite iron man story did you enjoy the video do you like the war machine armor more than the iron man armor what are your thoughts on that i know that's like a popular debate or at least was <laughs> yeah that's it uh, have a good one. Stay safe. Next month, we're going to do a part two to the Call of Duty Iceberg. I hope you're excited because uh, that should be fun. Hopefully. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to go to sleep. Have a good one. Ah!